Carolina Panthers, Cam Newton. Love Cam. <laughs> and I work for the Mecklenburg County Health Department. And I'm also a 2016 Auburn Fellow, which is part of the reason I'm standing here this morning giving this presentation. Um, and I'm hoping that after 8 o'clock tomorrow night, I can say I'm a 2016 Auburn graduate. Um, but at the Mecklenburg County Health Department, I, I serve as an H H supervisor for the HIV STD Community Testing and Outreach Program. Mecklenburg County has the highest rates of HIV in the state. There's 100 counties in the state of North Carolina, the highest rates out of all of them. So it's really important um, that as part of this, that I take this really into consideration. I'm really passionate about what I do as someone who has lived with HIV for over 30 years, and I get the opportunity to work with individuals who are coming into the health department that are newly diagnosed. That is really important for me because that's that first step and helping them to decide and help them get into access to care and get them started on the right track. I, I really do believe it takes a village of us to end this epidemic and it's going to take the black community to end the AIDS in the black community, which leads me to my presentation for today and my title presentation is It Takes a Village. What I'd like to start off with is just the state of AIDS in Mecklenburg County. There's over 1 million people who live in Mecklenburg County and over about 307,000 of those are African American, which is about 30% of the population. We have a poverty level at 15% but the medium household income is $59,000. But the majority of the low income, the low education, and the poverty are in the predominantly African-American communities. And 23% of African-Americans are unable to see doctors due to cost. And then 19% of African-Americans represent those who are uninsured. So when we look at the epidemiological data, we'll see that 55,000 excuse me, of people in Mecklenburg County are living with HIV. But what I want to really point out is what I have in bold, is that the racial and ethnic minorities represent only 52% of the county's population, but we account for 80% of the individuals living with HIV, and of those that 8% are minorities, 69% of those are African Americans. And men who have sex with men account for over 55% of that. So when our needs assessment was done in Mecklenburg County, it's done through our Ryan White agency. And the needs assessment looked at individuals who are already in care, and the survey respondents really don't, didn't represent the population where we're seeing the disease, the young black MSM. The majority of the respondents to our needs assessment were heterosexual. So it really didn't capture what we were really seeing and where the disease is because the young black MSM are individuals who are really not into care, but this dealt with individuals who was in care. So when we looked at our project, we really didn't use the needs assessment, but we went by our epidemiological data because that's where we saw things happening. And it also showed the needs of the community. That we needed culturally competent and compassionate care, testing services, access and linkage to care, psychosocial substance abuse services, services at the point of prevention intervention. The needs assessment show where even though we have a lot of services in Mecklenburg County, we still have some gaps that needs to be addressed according to this needs assessment. And those needs are set, those gaps are health insurance, housing, employment, transportation, mental health services, and as you can see, the last one that was listed was access to care or access to treatment. And that's mainly because, again, this already dealt with people who were in care already. So it really doesn't address what we were looking at. So talking about.
about dealing with and trying to get rid of the epidemic in the black community, the Black AIDS Institute, and that's their goal to end the AIDS epidemic in the black community. So one of the vehicles that they're using to do this is the Black Treatments Advocate Network. And the mission of the Black Treatment Advocates Network, which will be related referred to as BTAN, is to create increased access to and utilization of treatment and care, strengthening local leadership, and advocate for policy change in the black community. And the goal is to end the epidemic in the black community. And we're gonna do that through increasing HIV awareness, access to care, and using the four tenets of patient navigation, treatment education, disclosure, and advocacy. And the training will increase access and treatment for and educate stakeholders about political, social, medical systems in the community. These are the four areas that I went through that are the tenets of the detail. Charlotte is really just the developing chapter. Um, it's something that we started toward the end of my AHU fellowship. We actually just had our first BTAN meeting on March the 1st, and we've had really three good successful meetings since then. So we're really a developing BTAN chapter, but we made a lot of um, advances during that short period of time. The membership of BTAN is made up of the health department, which is a strong supporter of BTAN and really helps in having your BTAN be effective in your community. We also have ASOs. We have quality home care services who are our fiscal agent for this chapter. And the members of our chapter was recruited through other individuals in the community who was, we've either been collaborating with or people who sought out our chapter because they've heard through some of our membership about the BTAN and wanted to be a part of what we were doing and decreasing those disparities in the black community. This list slide is really full, but what I want to note is the ones I have in bold. Mecklenburg County, Quality Home Care, and the reach who I've already talked about, Regional Ace Interfaith Network, who does a lot of work in our community with PrEP and helping people get financing for PrEP and get prescriptions for PrEP, and Valentine Family Medicine, who's going to be part of our project program and teaching the care physicians up about PrEP and about HIV so that our individuals who go to physicians, they are more familiar with PrEP and can help out. And Time Out Youth, which is our local LGBT support group. And Johnson C. Smith, which is our HBU, one of our HBCUs in the area. And these are just a list of some of our other partners and some of our prospective partners that we are working with and currently in conversations with that we feel are really important to be a part of our BTN chapter. And when we look at engaging TBIs or our, our traditional black institutions, we've had uh, success with that currently. A lot of our members are already part of or a member of one of these TBIs or have an association with one of the TBIs. And we've already had some of the TBIs seeking us out because again, the word is getting around in the community about BTAN and what we're doing, even just in this short period of time. And that's been some of the successes that we've had currently. One of the challenges I think we're, we're going to face is, is dealing with traditional conservative African-American religious institutions with the whole men who have sex with men and dealing with that stigma. So that's going to be a little bit of a challenge for us. As part of this BTAN, we got to have the opportunity to work on a BTAN project for our chapter. So as I mentioned, my project is it takes a village, again, because I believe that's what's going to be required in order for us to make a difference in this epidemic. And my pro our problem statement is Mecklenburg County has the highest rate of HIV infection in the state, particularly in young black MSM 
and we're dealing with lack of adequate compassion and culturally competent access to care um, and a stigma because that prevents and set up barriers to prevention and care. So what our goal is, is to create these community level trainings that will focus on in general and also focus on um, primary health care individuals to help individuals um, get um, care and link access and linkages to care. And this, again, is going to be a duly focused training. So we're going to deal with the African-American community and also the healthcare providers. And this is one of the tenets and what their role will be. Their target population is going to be young black MSM physicians and ID doctors. And all of our trainees were looking at having 30 to 40 participants for our treatment education. It's going to be partnering with local healthcare providers like care and treatment engagement while we're having these community level trainings so that while the doctors are there, the individuals are there, they can have this interaction. And the outcomes that we're hoping from this is that participants will increase utilization and access to these medical services and they will have an increased knowledge of HIV treatment and that the healthcare providers will increase the knowledge about practice guidelines and that's what we're hoping the ID doctors will do for the primary care doctors. Patient navigation, same target population. The objectives here is to, so to help people who are living with HIV to understand the current processes of accessing medical care and to assist community stakeholders in better understanding the process of accessing care for all individuals who are living with HIV. And the participants from this training will be able to follow the step-by-step -step process of accessing care. Our disclosure will focus on young black men who have sex with men who are positive and those who are at risk. And the objectives will be to reduce the stigma around disclosure, by educating them about the laws, the HIV laws in North Carolina, and particularly the one about criminalization, which just really needs to be gotten rid of, and then to improve their communication skills about sexual health. And the outcome will be that they will be able to discuss and be familiar with at least three of the laws, and they will learn how to address stigma. And a final one, men who have sex with men, and the positive and those who are high risk for advocacy. And the objectives will be to address how individuals can fight, fight for policy change and access for all people, teach stakeholders how to stand up um, for political and medical, that the medical system, for people that the political and medical system ignore, and to address systemic discrimination within the community. And the outcome is, is that they will be giving community mobilization tools which I've learned here um, at AHU, that will be able to identify those policy changes. And as I mentioned a little earlier, we decided instead of using our needs assessment to use our epidemiological data because it focuses on the young black MSM, which is where we see the disease in the Mecklenburg County. And our needs assessment really focused on those already in care and the respondents weren't really the population in which we're seeing the disease. And some of the successes that we've already had in our project plan is that we have great support from our BTAN chapter for this project. And we've already used the four committees to formalize a project, as you can see from previous slides, to formalize their part of this project. So there's buy-in from them as well. Our challenges for this project is, is going to be getting young black men who have sex with men to participate and then to effectively recruit participation and retention of community faith um, based institutions. And we're looking to monitor the progress of these programs and how we're going to do that 
um, is through evaluations of trainings by participants and facilitators, looking at our project timelines to make sure things are happening when they're supposed to happen and when they're supposed to happen that we're meeting those milestones and looking at attendance. And these resources will be used to prepare for future trainings that we have to advertise for our trainings to see where we need to do the trainings, the advertisement, or we advertise it in the correct places, and to implement other trainings to advance from what we're doing now, or planning to do. And the evaluation for these will be done through pre and post test results, sign sheets using session evaluations, satisfaction surveys, and looking at training attendance. Now to talk about something that my success in this past nine months that I spent with most of you all um, is one, I've had the, the pleasure of having some of the greatest HIV researchers and professors to get that education from them and then to go out and educate others in my community with that information, which has been much needed for us. Uh, and I did that through four trainings, or five trainings actually, with a total of people. And I used the natural HIV natural history and basic science model and the HIV science and research. So those are the two I used, and those were used based on what was requested for me from the attendees. And my first training, I had 19 participants, and it really turned out well, 84. And this was out of 10 questions. 84% increased their scores by four points from the pretest, and 42% increased by five points. And my second training got a little better, had 10 participants, 90% increased their scores by four, and 50% increased their scores by five points. Training five, I had 50. This was a different presentation for me and the first time that I've used this particular training. Um, and but 70% of the individuals increased their scores by 5%. And these, I would say, were students from the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, from the social work program. And this was part of their HIV training for their social work program. So some of them had really was just starting to get that information and that training about HIV. So those scores really made me feel good based on that knowledge that they started out. The fourth training was back to natural history participants. This one didn't go as well as I liked. There was just a different level of understanding. Um, so this one, 20% increase in scores by 4% and 40% increase by five. And the last one that I did, 60% increase with the 4.5 and 60% increase by 4.5%. Evaluations turned out really well, in my opinion. 80% gained a better understanding of the HIV epidemic in their local area. 88% felt that the presentation was easy to understand. And 92% gained knowledge about natural history and science research. And 88% was more likely to talk about the training that they had received. And again, these are just some of the successes that I've already gone over. 94%, I mean, 94 were trained. The evaluation results were really positive. And the 94 indicated that they would attend another training. And 25 out of the 94 actually wanted to become members of BTAN. Challenges were scheduling conflicts, but trying to get all of the folks together at the same time and having some of the pre-test and post-test information get emailed to us. I had already had some of them scheduled, had to cancel. Um, and then just meeting the educational needs of some of the participants with varying knowledge um, of HIV. And these are just some of the pictures from the training. Um, I think this must have been my lucky shirt because I think <laughs> I wore this in the slack and every presentation so that, that that was my lucky shirt that, that that's why my percentage is good the other training that 
uh, along with the Black AIDS Institute and a great amount of help from Erica with the BAI, we got to do our Charlotte Prep Summit which was really put together in a short period of time, and we had a lot of success, I think, with it. We had 86 people who registered, and out of that, 76 of those attended the training. And we had some great presenters that talked about biomedical science overview, um, addressing black mistrust of medical establishment and biomedical research, which Phil from the Black AIDS Institute did. Um, young adults and HIV and young adults, which Gilead did for us, and had a panel discussion which focused around accessing health insurance and financing PrEP. And our regional AIDS interfaith network, which I talked about earlier, was a big part of that panel because that's what they do a lot, is to help people with financing PrEP and getting prescriptions for PrEP or finding access to some good legal information from Lambda, Lambda Legal and our representative from the Gilead also took part. And then we had some breakout sessions where we talked about how PrEP related to um, the different intersectionalities in our, community, in our community. We dealt with black, gay, same gender loving men, black heterosexual men, black heterosexual women, and black transgender women. The evaluations from our PrEP Summit, the evaluations turned out really well. 98% of the attendees had a favorable attitude for PrEP and biomedical interventions. 96% of the attendees were more familiar with the state of biomedical research, particularly as it relates to the black community. Successes were the positive surveys, and it really demonstrated the impact that this conference had on our community and the great need it had. So that was really one of the effective things. And that also we were able to recruit B10 members from this PrEP Summit. We had the PrEP Summit one day and we actually had our first B10 meeting the following day. And we got a lot of participation from people who attended this PrEP Summit the day before because that excitement was building. The challenges for our PrEP Summit, again, as I mentioned before, was starting a little bit late, so therefore we had a little short of time in doing publicity, um, and which dealt with less participation. But again, for what we started with and what we worked with, it was a great turnout. This is a flyer for our PrEP Summit, and that may be familiar to a lot of you. A couple of pictures from we actually had people out there. They unfortunately just wasn't people sitting in the chair, but we really had <laughs> folks out in the audience. Successes and challenges with the fellowship. Um, some of the best science and treatment education. And I'm just really grateful for this opportunity that I had to have this experience because I really learned a great deal. So that's really fortunate that I had the opportunity and honor to do that. Um, and the skills that I've learned in planning, program planning and community development, which will be a great use in our B10 chapter and doing our project. Presenting to these 94 people the opportunity to start this B10 chapter in Charlotte, the PrEP Summit, and that this experience has really helped boost my confidence um, and, and my skills. Um, you might not think that from today. But it really did, and uh, I was very fortunate to have this opportunity. Some of the challenges with the fellowship was really the time to complete um, our internships and some of the requirements just based on the amount that was required. And in the beginning, some miscommunications, but that was initially that got worked out over time. So all of that turned out well. Conclusions and recommendations is I'm going to continue being a part of BTAN. I really think it's going to be a great effort for our community and just continuing with the development of our chapter, the leadership, project development, recruiting of new community partners. Just as far as leadership, 
recruitment education, and then just evaluating the effectiveness, the effectiveness of the projects we're doing and the effectiveness of the BTAN chapter itself. And this is my presentation for It Takes a Village. I appreciate you all sitting, being attentive, which I've noticed, <laughs> and taking part of this. And it has been an honor. And thank you. For questions? Sure. Do you have a question that you want to ask? Uh, as a I did such a good job keeping <laughs> 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 I'll start. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you had a great presentation, so congratulations. Thank you. Guys you. Have done so much work in B10 Charlotte, and I think you mm -hmm. captured um, that work really well in your presentation. Um, and you have a great presentation style. I really like the template as well, I love the slide templates. Um, I think you did a really interesting analysis of your traditional black institutions, particularly thinking about um, some of the challenges with the conservatism that might happen. Mm -hmm. um, that it's important to have them at the table, but I think also understanding some of the challenges um, is really important. It gives you a clear picture of some, what you're going to go up against. So I thought that was um, really great. Um, a couple questions. Um, you talked about the need assessment that Mecklenburg County did. Right. Um, and how it didn't, um, you felt like didn't really capture the most at-risk population. Can you talk to me a little bit more? I know that that's something that you did personally, <laughs> but uh, what um, what that kind of looked like and how you think that maybe BTM can support um, making sure that the needs assessment actually captures the communities um, in, in the future. Right. right. Well, what Ryan White does, and that's who does, and Ryan White is part of, in, of the Mecklenburg County Health Department. Um, so Ryan White does a different, I'll say population of individuals each time they do a needs assessment. So this particular time, which was the latest one, was the one that dealt with um, people who, who are in care. So they reached out to the Ryan White providers, and that's how they reached uh, the majority of their respondents. Um, so they didn't really talk about um, what we're seeing with the high rates of young black MSM. They weren't really a big part of this because they're not the ones who are already access to care. But what really is we're looking forward to is Ryan White just recently did a needs assessment or in the process of putting that data together who have or who are not in care or have fallen out of care so that information will become available sometime this year so b10 will use that information um, we didn't have access to that because it was just they're still in the process of putting all that data together but we will be looking at that and that was one of the things we looked at because if that hadn't happened B10 Charlotte was actually looking at a way that we could do some type of needs assessment so that we can get the clearest picture possible about what was happening in, in the community. Uh, I, <laughs> um, I, I do agree that the presentation was um, seeing that you're doing it by yourself. Uh, the only question that I do have is that throughout the um, trainings and internships that you had presented, um, as far as the trainings you had with providers, were any community members involved um, in the trainings as well as far as the knowledge on HIV? Yeah. My um, science and treatment trainings, um, there weren't any pro providers. Everybody thus far has been in prevention, but our project that B10 will be doing will include providers and the community, our population community, and those um, that are living with the disease will be a part of that training. Um, because the training will be to the general population and to providers, but the focus will be the MSM population and those who are infected and those at high risk. Because we want to build the um, African community around this issue and realize it's just not a gay issue uh, and that, you know, because based on all this stigma and not having adequate access to care, 
that we're seeing all this stuff, and it's going to take all of us, and with the, particularly with the re conservative, I'm going to say conservative um, religious institutions that we got to do. It's not about sin. It's not about who we're having sex with with the individual and dealing about the love part and not the hate part. And that's why I'm optimistic. It's, it's a challenge we're up for, and, but I do think it's going to be a challenge. But some of some of, some of the traditional black institutions in Charlotte do have HIV programs, um, and, and they are moving more toward um, working and, and, and getting past that. But, there, but as we know, there's still some that are conservative that it's just it's going to be we're going to need those other faith institutions to help us with it to get across to them as well and to get past that this is a sin and we're going to that statement we're going to deal we're going to love this this not we're not going to love the sin but we're going to love the person but not the sin and that's just a totally ridiculous um concept and and, and my opinion as someone who's gone through the church and had a pastor tell me that black gay men were a disgrace to the black race and kind of things that took me out of the church for a while. But we got some work to do, but we're up for the task. Thank you all. Any questions from the group? No. No questions. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love my people. <laughs> Did I did you stop it? Do you want to uh, next presentation doesn't start till what time? Yes. Yeah, we'll start at nine forty five for the next presentation so that people can make sure they're straight again. So maybe a, a nine minute break. You can stay in here though. <laughs>
Good morning. 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 Good I'm kind of a community, a community person, but my work in the community was amplified by this fellowship. So there's a lot of terms that I learned through this fellowship, and it was really challenging in terms of how to put up programs together because it's something that I've never done before. I've always been the one attending, so I was through this fellowship challenged to be organizing some of those events. So. So kind of an overline and a line is going to be just talking about the demographic profile in Minnesota and most likely in Minneapolis and St. Paul because most of the time it's called Twin City. So those, twin, those two cities are called are under the name Twin City. And we also have the bit and effort and what I'm going to be doing on my project. So one other thing about um, uh, Minnesota is that um, is ranked as one of the healthiest states, but it also, when you're looking at the sample and the Minneapolis population, only blacks contribute to 18%, uh, roughly 18% of, of the population on those cities. But when you're looking at the entire state, only 5% of its state. And one of the unique things about that state is going to be the fact that we have a large population of uh, African-born immigrant refugees also. So this is just a representation of kind of what I was talking about and looking at the uh, uh, black and the percentage is different between Minneapolis and Minnesota, but it's roughly around, around at least 15%. And when you're looking at the, the median household on income, it's about $40,000. So, so I wanted to just, since it's one of the unique things, um, one of the reasons why we have a huge influx of African-born immigrants in that uh, state is because the effort of uh, making that state a little bit more diverse, so to increase minority. So that's why most of the refugees, uh, all the, I mean, people get in there maybe through green card, they win the green card or studies, and most people are there like refugees. So that means all those companies who are dealing with that try to um, push those uh, uh, African-born uh, individuals in that in Minnesota. So, I mean, I know that uh, looking at the, both uh, both uh, population, African-American and both African-born, big things are that uh, kind of on top of what African born. I would say there's similar issue, but one of the things that is specific to African born is that some of them might not be speaking English, and some of them might be multilingual, like everybody else. Uh, like what is common is that we fear, they fear a lot of uh, uh, healthcare, so we uh, they rely more on self treatment. Um, going to the hospital is the last resort. And also, with all this thing about healthcare bills, all the bills, it's kind of like a fear factor. The fact, the, the, just the fact that you might have a bill is, is enough for them not to come to treatment. So when we're looking at the population of people living with HIV AIDS in Minnesota, we have about uh, in Minneapolis and St. Paul, it's going to be roughly about, let's say, in the 50% people living in, live in HIV AIDS in generally. And one other thing about Minnesota is like when you're looking at the CDC, it's not really, it's kind of like a, a state as, as far as HIV AIDS is concerned. So we are, uh, right now looking at the total number of kids, roughly of 8,000, this is how the representation is across the main area of Minnesota. So, and also when we're looking at uh, as classification by male versus um, female, Female are only about 26% of the case. But what we're going to look at when we're looking at how, um, how, um, 
how they are affected by the by the um, the disease is much more there's a high disparity because when we're looking at African uh, African female and African born is roughly about seventy percent of the cases. So it's like a a lot of um, females of uh, black female living with that. So I mean, this was just a, like uh, another thing. And one other thing about is that uh, look uh, studies when we're looking at past studies, it looks like um, the amount of uh, like the number of cases has decreased when you're looking at African American. But uh, even though it's still the percentage is high, but when you're looking at African born female, the the women uh, African born the the percentage is increasing, and we have about fifty two percent of those uh, ladies living uh, with HIV. So this is just a representation of different uh, country, uh, state in a uh, country in in uh, Minnesota with the different number of cases of HIV in that though in represented. So Cameroon, I'm from Cameroon, so we have a uh, uh, about some about around uh, eight, eight, eight people cases that were um, uh, represented. And Ethiopian is, and also this represent also the demographic. This is a uh, foreign demographic and Ethiopia. It's one of those countries where mostly is refugee. So when we're looking at the, the new cases of HIV, we have a females uh, um, looking at uh, residences. And when we are, uh, I was trying to focus in Minneapolis and maybe Central, the, the, it's not that um, high in percentage, but we have a list about um, Roughly 30% of cases in those in the Twin City area. And the diagnosis um, females and, like we're saying, female African born and, and also African American have a high percentage of high diagnosis, diagnosis, roughly more than at least 50% compared to male. I'm just focusing on the females, not really the male. Uh, looking at the when they 2015 when they were looking at the age category, about 44 percent of cases were people age under um, under 30, and females were about 30, 32 percent of the cases. So, and um, that's um, that's the reason why my target population and tends to the fact that it's going to be the adult age is going to be the adult age will be 18 here in the U.S. and Looking at the age range, it's going to be easier to talk about certain topic compared to other um, other um, other uh, generation. We're not trying to get a unique uh, sample that encompass uh, African American and African born. It will be easier if I target the 18 to 30. Year. But I know that in the African American section, it won't be as uh, it will be much more. It could be a wider group. But looking at the African born and the the population and the belief is going to be easier if I target the younger people. So that's why, and based on also the um, the fact that age under 30 year, when representing a lot of cases, that's why I also target that population. So my gap analysis, I would just say that when we're looking at the the, the percentage of uh, people like black black people generally living in. In in the in Minnesota, we have a high disparity because we only have like one percent living or four percent. Let's say four and five. In total, five percent. Four percent will be for the black uh, African American, and one percent for the um for the uh, African born. There's a lot of disparity. So I and a lot of the new cases are mostly for the black population. So that's why I. There's a lot of work to do with the, uh, the black population, especially the, uh, the black female. And I'm taking the black female because um, when I look at the work in the HIV AIDS area, it's, it's a lot of work working with the, the, black, the males. So that's why I was trying to see how to bring the female at the table. So I think we So I was, uh, my next thing will be, talking about the black treatment of, of advocate network so so this is the, about the mission and that's what i'm trying to achieve because minneapolis is kind of like a, a new chapter 
we have had in the past about two hour graduate, but the the chapter is not really up and rolling as the 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 goal that the so I would be more like a, trying to my goal was trying to see if I can revamp the chapter and see how to sus make it sustainable. So what these are the four treatment the project uh, project area that I was trying to um, tr uh, I'm trying to um, achieve in the next uh, in in the process. But where my project will be focused a lot will be treatment education at this point. So looking at the development, what I I would think I I it was things was easier for me because the past one of the past fellow and the one that introduced me to this fellowship and um, Bill Larson has already has a network so he introduced me to different organizations that he had contacts with and I also have to establish the partnership and I will say that um, and also through them through him I was able to establish some science and treatment presentation and also a three day pre time training but actually I ended up to do two days because we didn't have enough speaker for the three that's the third day and I have to cancel that. And one of the challenges that I've been having so far is gonna be what is actually getting the meeting uh, meeting up and rolling. I'm a full time student and also doing this was really difficult for me to work around the schedule. So and that's where one of my difficulties that I had, and also when I was trying to reach out to different organizations by sending out letters, it was really difficult, and I couldn't get uh, past the past my initial letter. So even when I was trying, even uh, I can get a positive uh, reply, always uh, it was difficult to go past it. And one of the opportunities that I found when I was doing my training was like the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, it looks like they're trying to find a way of coordinating the prevention and the, um, the community and the treatment area. So kind of uh, the work uh, that goes aligned with what the beta are trying to achieve. And they were really interested in moving forward. So we'll be most likely uh, see how to get in touch with them and see how we can move in that direction. So um, we have a lot of community-based uh, organizations. I, I would say Scale Step Foundation and and it's like a community-based uh, community organization, definitely, but they train different people in different churches about different topics. And what I would say is that she, uh, they, as, uh, when we do our, our fellowship application, the Step Step Foundation is one, uh, is what the organization that uh, support me to be here. And the Minnesota Oberlin, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit later, they also brought me with the venue and coordinating the one of my trainings. And also, African uh, the African American Ed Stacks Force and it's going to be through the Willow program. Uh, I am in touch with one of the coordinator over there, and she also somehow brought her support throughout the process. And also, our world is going to be another organization that just trying to get all the African um, immigrant organization together. So when I look at the B time training, I had a I had a lot of difficulty to get this one schedule, but finally I was able to get at least one of these schedule. It was true and, and through the connection through my uh, mentor, uh, Bill Larson, and also my supervisor, Bill Larson, is going to be this one, and my mentor, um, my supervisor, Chuck Howard. So they made me join a presentation by the Bristol Mayor's script, the HIV cure, because I liked the topic. I thought it was so cheesy to talk about that and uh, it was really interesting to see that people um, among uh, I had about 13 attendees it was interesting to, to see that people uh, most of them didn't realize that uh, taking a heart was not really a cure so for me it was really uh, good to bring that topic to the table and also talking about um, the uh, the Berlin patient So this is my two-day uh, B10 science and treatment training, and I had it in two uh, slots. And I have uh, on the first day I have um, Lisa. Lisa. Lisa, yeah, she, uh, she came all the way from I think uh, Georgia, yeah, and also had the different. These are women four topics, 
And that was a title that I should allow if you live in positive or negative, what matters? And, and, and the topic ranged from um, what are the issues from in the black, in, uh, black communities, the basic science about HIV, and also the issues in the Afri uh, African born population, and also, uh, also issues about uh, black women and HIV. And also we have some topic about um, pediatric, um, pediatric, and we have this past, so this past was really, really um, a good one. It was really challenging us to, how do I say that? Like it looks to, ch to, to uh, challenging uh, people to embrace, embrace sexuality because it looks like uh, it's something that we uh, generally portray to be separate from ourselves. So a uh, uh, pediatric, uh, talk and one other thing about this, uh, I realized like in Minnesota about there's a lot of uh, pe uh, um, uh, kids that are born and acquire HIV at birth. So, so that's a, uh, so that means they have to go through the process of at the early age um, getting a medication and try and through the process of like when they get the adult age where uh, they get they learn how to get their position by themselves. So there's like a program that helped them with that, at the, the, this, this lady. Helping out, yes. And also, we also have a talk, topic about, um, about HIV adherence. So I would say that our the whole, I had about 50 attendees spread out, attendees spread out. But so the first day it was, the way the, 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 the event went, I had a lot of difficult, difficulty to get a venue, to get a schedule, and also I didn't have enough time to to um, to make a uh, uh, to send marketing. But no, overall we got for that short amount of time that we had. I think I had about one week to do marketing. It wasn't that bad to get that amount of people. We had about fifty on both sides, and also we also have, we send out the it's sort of we send out the we through the Minnesota Department of Health we send the link to about four hundred providers. We can, but we got about fifty, and and everybody um, liked the topic, and I have a lot of, I think out of it, even though they didn't mark it on the evaluation, I know that there was about, um, I would say across the border uh, about um, ten that were interested in coming back, but I think that if I, uh, my work was to be to follow up with sending out, sending out, uh, connected with them, but I haven't done that because I have to juggle full time. Uh, school and everything else. Um, and and my beta project uh, right now. My uh, my like, uh, my progress statement it was just to increase um, to the address the level of stigma, increase and empower women, black women, in HIV in Minneapolis, Minnesota. My extended to sample also, uh, especially my target. Age group will be 18 to 30, 18 to 30 years, and who are exposed to HIV. But I think uh, overall, my uh, I am looking at uh, in cognitive uh, behavioral uh, behavioral uh, education in terms of race, uh, behavior that can increase or decrease risk. What you can do about that, and also maybe for those uh, treatment as prevention in case of we have a. For H, I mean, try to cover the spectrum HIV positive or negative. So, tying along with what I have for my uh, three-day uh, training, uh, looking into uh, the broad spectrum HIV positive or negative. If you're coming, this is what will happen. So, in terms of the discrediting rates of PrEP, uh, or maybe uh, for the people who are HIV positive, I'm talking about uh, the um, uh, treatment and prevention. Why? Um, Important. Why is important to take the medication? And overall, I in the level of uh, behavior, behavior, I am hoping to um, uh, for if it's going to be using a condom, having a consistent use of condom is what it is, or maybe if prep is necessary for some of the um, prep, uh, that would be an option. Or uh, long long term, maybe people taking uh, medication. And in, in, in with the with the sense of uh, decreasing the risk or maybe getting healthier for themselves and achieving a better health. Um, 
generally, I would say that um, uh, HIV AIDS in the black um, community in uh, Minnesota, especially in Minneapolis, example, is gonna is gonna be is a big issue and 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 um, a lot of effort from what I got from the training. A lot of people are trying to see uh, what can be done to address the need of that population and also the need of the African born because we have a lot of maybe depending on the religion, depending on where what part of um, Africa you are, certain things are difficult to. And based on how I grew, where, where I grew up, I would say it's a lot of stigma. So the, I think the stigma is really profound and also over there. I think even talking about this issue, I don't think they can disclose easily. So, and that's what a, one of the issues that was uh, across the border when I was doing my training, how can we do not only to address the African-American uh, um, need and also the, uh, the black person, the, the African boy. And also, and also how to have a com cultural competent um, a provider of staff or community provider of people working in the community to address the entire uh, population. So right now my next step will be hopefully engage the interest of uh, partnership and also see how the uh, I can establishment of an independent B10. So I want to acknowledge the black the staff of the Black Institute and everybody at the UCLA we talk about in our and I also want to uh, 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 acknowledge Bill Larson and also Chuck Howard uh, to my mentor and supervisor. If they were if it wasn't of them, I wouldn't know about this training and I wouldn't be here today. And also my old class of fellow class of 2016 because I am still here because of thank you very much and, and hope I can attain questions as well. Questions from the panel? Um, no, there was, she seemed to have overcome a lot of challenges with uh, getting to the population. I know that at home, even that population is difficult to engage with when, when it comes to talking about HIV. So are they, have they been more receptive because you're part of the community or just in general because you're actually reaching out to them? Uh, I, I, I will say that technically I haven't, you're talking about like the actual population or the providers? Oh, the, the, well, no, the, the African-born population. African-born population, I would say that when I went to, uh, when I went to the what they call the African world, um, mm -hmm. At this, there were a lot of diff a lot of special organization that were there, mm -hmm. like African doing the HIV aid. When I was approaching those organiza organization, they were telling me that the best way sometimes is to go through people that they know, and then from then you can approach them. So that means you have to be a familiar face. So my thing was that from my approach is that to get connected to somebody who knows the thing before getting into it. that was it's always a step in between. So my thing was that from that connection, I, even myself, I cannot get easily in touch with the African born population. There's so, so many steps. There's something that they call African leadership over there. I don't know what the African leadership is. I, I will be in touch with them, but uh, the lady who works at Willow, she is the one who is like me. Probably she's working with them. So I don't know how to get to them. So I have to go through uh, her. So that means even me, I haven't got this a direct relationship with the actual people, but I know that the organization that are kind of like able even to bring testing to their homes and do the testing. And when I was looking at the provider during our training, one provider was talking, the lady who talks about um, the, the, the uh, HIV and women, she was talking about the fact that definitely having, it's not that the, the population of community or the provider is not really um, diversified. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when she, the feedback she gets from the, the, the people, the women of color or the black people, she's talking about where if they're like, you know, I mean, she can sense that it's an elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. So that means they um, they still, it would be nice to have a diverse, um, um, diverse um, either. That would be helpful 
at the end of the day, she was like, can I get your number? I, mean, I never follow up with her, but I was like, maybe there was an opportunity, but I never follow up with what she meant. I, I want to know you better, but I don't know what she meant with that, but I never follow up with that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, you talked a lot about some of the challenges that you have, you. Uh, particularly that, like the capacity is a biggest challenge with being a full-time student and other things you have going on. And so that um, some of the follow-up that you wanted to do with people at the training and like, other people that were potent- that could have potentially participated in BTAT, yeah. um, you weren't able to do. Yeah. Moving forward, um, how do you think you might be able to utilize other people? Um, so whether it's two office fellows, people that went to your training, to support you in these activities. Um, so it's not as much of a time burden on you? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, like I was saying, this fellowship has introduced me to an area that I, I wasn't familiar with, like the community side and how to do this. It's something that I, I, have, I have been, I know that even the process of getting the program and the training was through the hope of some of the fellows because I know that Crystal mailed me uh, some of what she did before and I used that as a template. I know that also the uh, BI sent me a lot of templates to help me with this and I had a lot of feedback. Moving forward is going to be try to keep in touch and, uh, because it, it touch with uh, the hour class and see what I can do and and also First of all, trying to see if I can have a general email of all the people who have attended and see and send it back to see who's interested and not uh, interested in having a meeting and moving forward. That was what I was thinking for this summer. And I know that I was trying also to get a prep summit, but it wasn't, it couldn't fit my, it couldn't fit with what I was, um, I was, I was uh, trying to do, uh, my schedule and all the things. But I know that when I was talking about the prep summit at the time during the training, there was a lot of people were interested, and there were a lot of people who were really trying to see how can we move this thing forward, because we have people wanted to be interested. So, what can I do to get that really established? Because I think that especially with the Minnesota Department of Health, they have similar works and they're trying to see. And there was actually one person in the prevention of the person coordinating the, those coalition was really into it that he wanted to do it. So. And maybe bringing it back to my supervisor and mentors to see what I can do, and maybe asking uh, support from the BAI to see how to move forward. So that's what I can say. I would recommend as you move forward to think about, uh, as you're having those conversations with people, mm-hmm. to be able to say, you know what, I only have a little bit of time, and I need for you to lead this. And ask people to have leadership roles in okay. um, doing the work so that you can take yourself out of some of those pieces. Yeah. Um, and really only give your time to what you are able to do. Yeah. So as you move forward, think about that. Um, and really trying to bring up other people to lead some of the work as opposed to you trying to coordinate other people doing it. Yeah, I, I, that's the level of leadership that I'm struggling with. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, that would be nice that we can, I can do that. Because I, um, Jeff was mm-hmm. talking about that. I was like, wow, I wish I could have done that. How you have to spread out, mm-hmm. you know. I was lacking throughout the process. I wish at a certain time where I had somebody Doing certain things, so I have heard from my mentor. But at the at the training event, I was the taking the registration that like people getting in, making sure things work. So I was at the same time the one presenting, introducing the speakers. I mean, I was doing everything by myself. So I wish at that time I had somebody. But yeah, thank you very much. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry with leadership, but I have to work on that part. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I <didn't>. Hey. <laughs> When working with African-born women, mm-hmm. what are the greatest barriers you see as it pertains to them disclosing you know, HIV status? The greatest barrier? Hmm. I mean, I, I think uh, the greatest barrier will be, first of all, the thing about, depending on the who you're talking to, depending on the generation, depending on the thing, it's going to be about because I'm talking about HIV, talking about it's about sexuality, whatever leads to it sometimes. So that would be it because it's about talking about a taboo like sexuality. And sometimes nobody want to, they want, they don't, I mean, depending on the generation, I don't have any problem talking about sexuality. But depending on where you're coming from, yeah. And something about it, so even if you're trying to disclose it, you don't know the repercussion at home. You don't know if you're disclosing, does that mean my husband have it? 
it, it, I mean, depending on the type of relationship we have and depending on the society, what type of uh, country and how, what type of system, you don't know if it's going to be, she, maybe she's afraid of violence at home. And sometimes also African is about, am I still able to have kids? I mean, disclosing comes with all that kind of stuff, the stigma, I mean, maybe not even knowing it or maybe the, what, how would people see, uh, is it something that I can discuss with my husband, if I disclose that, how do I even talk about sexual relationship with them if they're married, especially the uh, other uh, ladies in who are in a married relationship? So that there's so many things into consideration. How do I handle? If I do that, how do I get my medication? Even now, if I disclose, if I even, I mean, question: Do they even know it? I don't know if they know. If they know it, how do I handle going home? And now you should wear condoms if I if I married. So there are so many things into the into consideration. I don't know if I I, I was kind of because even me sometimes the certain things I cannot because I I have a different things I I view things differently. I was educated differently. So the certain things I cannot really tell because I am biased by the way I, feel, I see things. So but that would be one of the things like questioning. I mean I think you have some feedback because you've been dealing with yeah. Dealing with that, uh, the consequence of telling it. How do I handle it at home? Is it even something that I can still stay at home or one? Or maybe younger generation don't have that problem. Yeah, younger generation. Any questions or comments from the Yeah, thank you. I actually cried. Thank you. Just seeing you from when you came. Yeah, I was a baby man. I'm so proud of you, man. I'm so proud of you. Yeah. That was so dope. Yeah. Light years better than you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was just a, a baby when I came here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think every time I come to the training, I come back much more higher than I was before. So I can talk back. Sometimes I can pull some sometimes. So sometimes you gotta. I'm just joking, but you got some girls some tough kids to be able to handle some, some jokes, but yeah. that's fine part of it and I'm happy that I've been here. I think this is one of the best experiences that I ever got in my life. So I always like it. It was a pleasure coming back. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our presentation. Uh, I would first like to say thank you very much to the Black AIDS Institute as well as to the UCLA staff. The the opportunity that has been given to the both of us has been an amazing experience for us, us both equally. Um, so I want to first say I'm George Jackson, um, better known as George Mizrahi. I happen to be a legendary uh, house and ball community father representing AIDS Project of the East Bay, which is out of Oakland, California. Um, I came to this work in 2012 as a prevention specialist and have since become a science and treatment advocate. Um, thanks to, largely in part to the Black AIDS Institute and the African American HIV University. Um, I became the overall West Coast father for the organization uh, Institute of Mizrahi in 2014. And uh, since then, I have overseen the entire West Coast uh, chapters of uh, Mizrahi and have been positioned in a place where I've been fortunate enough to be the person who I've always wanted to be for others. Um, and that's kind of the model that Cameron and I live by, and it sort of brings us to this work, is that we like to be the people in which we want and when we are growing up together. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. I am Cameron Crump, as um, George has said before. And I serve right now as the Community Outreach Coordinator <clears throat> for AIDS Project of the East Bay, also Pharmaceutical Training Liaison, and the Public Relations and Media Relations for AIDS Project of the East Bay. I'm also a co-chair of B10 Bay Area. And the both of us have now joined the Community Advisory Group for Bridge HIV, so we're really excited about that. As George has mentioned earlier, being the person we needed when we were younger is um, one of our driving forces. And one of the programs that we talk about, both of the programs that we talk about, treatment education and also advocacy, and we'll be talking about some programs that have to do with a lot of the youth, serving the youth, and working within the home, trying to get the home and families involved um, within the children's lives and making sure that they're aware and conscious as to what's going on and not putting their faith before um, raising their children. All right. And so we'll talk a little bit about our city and sort of our overview of our B10 chapter and our experience uh, over the last couple of months. B10 is, is very interesting in the sense that it's comprised of a, a lot of different uh, ball community leaders. We have executive directors, we have a faith based organization, and even trans uh, folks and cisgender women who all comprise our B10. Um, and we all bring indigenous experience and social influence to our B10, which makes this very, a very interesting and unique uh, B10 chapter. Um, so we'll talk a little bit first about the overview of Oakland and sort of what our uh, profile looks like and turn that over to you. So Shadow City, we all know whenever you hear the Bay Area, everyone always says San Francisco, right? but no one really talks about Oakland too much. And a lot of times, especially out here, if I'm in Los Angeles and I say, oh, I'm from the Bay Area, I'm from Oakland, a lot of times they'll say, oh, San Francisco, I've been to San Francisco, I love San Francisco. And so that's what we mean by shadow city. Oakland is one of the shadow cities um, in the Bay Area. It's right across from um, San Francisco. And I like to call the Bay Area Gay Jerusalem. Because I feel like everyone across the United States thinks of the Bay Area as a place to be free. You know, you think about the history with the Castro, you think about Harvey Milk, and you think about driving across the United States and living the life that you want to live. But in the end, it costs so much. It's so to maintain a lifestyle in San Francisco. And with that, you run into these problems after a while. You run into social and economic inequity. You run into poverty. You run into incarceration. You run into lack of access to health care. 
And then you also are dealing with racism and sexism as well as homophobia. Because within um, San Francisco, a lot of times because of African Americans and the Castro, they are fetishized. And so a lot of times too, when they move to San Francisco, if they can't maintain a way of living that they would like to, they move to Oakland and then they are not receiving the care that they would get as an individual living in San Francisco because they are receiving a lot of funding for organizations or for different programs that they are doing. And so, as Cameron said, I think it's very interesting or important to point out that um, from this slide, the only thing that's really important to point out is that we've pretty much had about the same amount of new cases uh, for HIV um, in Alameda County, which is to about 266 uh, amongst males and about 69 uh, new cases amongst uh, women. Down here, you'll see that we, we in Oakland bear about one third of the burden of HIV in the, in the Bay Area. However, as you can see with funding, we don't even receive close to one third of the, the shared fiscal uh, money. And so we sort of see Brian White funding over in uh, San Francisco with $26 million. Over in Oakland, it's only 6.7. And you see, as many other people have explained today, in communities where bear most of the burden of HIV. And so if we're getting less of the money and most of the burden, you can see why the disparities continue to, to go in the opposite direction. Um, and this is just another slide showing some other shadow cities. So you see Oakland to San Francisco. You'll see Portland to Seattle. You'll see San Diego to Los Angeles. Milwaukee to Chicago. Uh, New York and New Jersey. Uh, DC and Baltimore. Um, many of the cities that are affected, again, you'll see down here in the south, New Orleans and Baton Rouge, but many of these cities are actually represented here at VTAN, and uh, it's one of the reasons why we all are committed to doing the work that we're doing. Um, and so the important thing to take away from this is that our target population obviously will be the most impacted people, which will be Black and African American people, uh, underserved communities, and uh, individuals living without health care, and especially youth. The two of us are committed to youth uh, for many different reasons, but we believe that if we can get into these kids' heads between 13 and 24, then we can create a generation where some of this stuff just does not exist. Um, and you can go over this slide. So this is showing over here people living with HIV. This is by the city, I'm trying to get the thing here. City and region, Alameda County over here. And it's basically reinforcing what we saw before Oakland, Emeryville, and you see how far Oakland is here out of all of the other cities in Alameda County. And then we also have poverty rates by race, ethnicity, and age in California. And if you look here, 29%, and then also age. So Black Treatment Advocates Network, our Oakland chapter, <clears throat> it is comprised of um, a few members. Uh, like he said before, we have uh, Denisha Delane from Allen Temple, as well as myself as the co-chairs. We have Jordan Mizrahi. Um, we have the House Bar community. We have different um, agencies that are represented, and they also help support and collaborate with a lot of our trainings. And you see them here. Some of our collaborators, our collaborations and partnerships are with Berkeley Youth Alternatives. Allen Temple, Bridge HIV, Imani Community Church, which is an inclusive APEVH project of the East Bay where we both work, Castlemont High School and Realm High School. We found a way to infiltrate into the high schools and start doing a lot of sex education. And we've been doing sex positive 101 where we talk about PrEP, we talk about PEP, we do HIV biomedical, um, HIV treatment, all of that. These are the four areas that BTAM focuses on, and we decided to focus on treatment and advocacy. So this is my program here, the parent, the child, and the process. And so picture it, 2001, okay? You know, freshman, high school, 
living with my parents, uh, parents, minister, uh, mother evangelist, you know, very interesting atmosphere to be raised up in. But at the same time, it's a narrative that is shared across the gay men community, being raised in the church, a lot of stigma and dealing with sexuality. And so I remember one day in particular being on the other side of the wall, of the kitchen wall, while the nurse who took care of my grandfather was talking to my father and brought up sexuality. And I'm sure she knew that I was gay, <laughs> you know, and it wasn't a conversation that I had with my parents yet or my brothers and all of this other stuff, but I knew what it was. And she was having this conversation with my father and me being the youngest of three boys, I admired my father, still do, you know, and I look up to him so much. And she brought up sexuality and she asked, what would you do if one of your sons were gay? And I remember my father saying, I don't know what I would do. I'd either kill them or kill myself. So at that moment, it was like, oh my gosh, what do I do? This is the person that I love and that I look up to. And this is my father and he feels this way. Not only that, he's the one that introduced me to God. So if he feels this way, then God must feel this way about me. And instantly I went into just a slope of depression, suicide, and all of these things. And I went outside of the home trying to learn for myself what this is that I was dealing with. What is this layer that I have to wear? So with that, I wanted to develop this program. Like I said, being the individual that I needed when I was younger, going out there and seeking young people that need to be educated on sexuality, HIV, and how they can prevent themselves from transmitting HIV or receiving HIV or contracting HIV. And so this is it right here. This is my problem statement. To address and improve the knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors of parents raising children a part of the LGBTQ2IA, BC, ABFG <laughs> community around HIV prevention, testing, stigma, and safety. It's all about having safety within the home. If they are feeling safe within the home, then the parents can educate them and talk to them about any questions that they may have. Also, in that situation, I knew even from now that that's not my father. It's not his fault. He's just uneducated. He didn't know anything about it. So what can we do to prevent that from happening for other children in the future? And that's what this is about. So our target population is parents raising children, teens that desire to foster a healthy relationship with their child. So if you look here, this is age group. And this is talking about zero to 12 years old, and this is 13 to 19 and 20 to 29. These years are very impressionable when living in the home. Very impressionable, outside of the home as well, because they're looking for advice, they're still learning about a lot of things. And it's the same thing here, average annual rates of newly diagnosed HIV cases by age group in Alameda County. And here, 20 to 29, very impressionable. So we're gonna do a quick thing of family food, <laughs> okay? I'm gonna ask you a question. And I'm interested in knowing the answer, and I'll pick you, Jeff. <laughs> I pick you, Jeff. And I'm gonna ask you, because you were 21 last year. Right. <laughs> I'm gonna ask you up to within your family. It was my mother, but I think more now, it's one of my sisters um, who happens to be the support system. But it was your mother. It was my mother. So during a focus group, this was asked to the youth during a survey. Who do you look up to and admire within your family? Majority of them said mother. Others said father. And the rest said their parents together, which goes to show they have a large influence on them while they're in the home. So they can be teaching them all of these things while they're in the home and going through that impressionable stage, high school, college, parents. 
These questions were asked to the parents during a survey. How did you feel when you first learned your son, daughter, or daughter was a part of the LGBTQ2IA community? Okay. So, a lot of them said scared, uh, worried, because they felt like, and this, a, a lot of them did mention this, they said they were black, young men, and they felt like having gay on top of that is going to be a problem. So they were scared and worried. Others said frustrated, upset, and angry, I don't, confused. Before confirming your son was a part of this community, what did you do? A lot of them said, I cut them off. A lot of them said, I kept a distance, but tried to learn for myself and didn't know how to talk about it. A lot of them said they just kept it ambiguous and did not converse at all. So with monitoring this process and evaluating, I'm using Cho Schrader. She's an evaluator at APEB and also helps out with our B10. And we are coming up with tools, coming out with tools that help us evaluate this, especially the progress after the parents have come to focus groups and a few of the panel discussions. The, reason, the way we were able to get these parents a part of the program is by going to counselors at BYA, and they knew and identified parents and students that were willing to be a part of this to foster a healthy relationship. The surveys were checked in with the counselors and having parents sign them, and then also afterwards to monitor their progress to see if they'd be willing to release some progress forms or uh, progress notes done by their counselors to us so we can see if the relationship is being better, if there are any changes that are happening anymore. So the success was finding participants and finding facilitators that were willing to share their narrative, also from faith-based communities, and also finding youth participants, focus group, we had one with just parents alone, we had one with just youth alone, and then we had a collaborative. Another success was getting them to open up and be involved. Challenges is finding ways to monitor the progress and being able to have a consistent set of individuals because they have families. <laughs> Therefore, they have different times, so we don't get a consistent set. They come and then it's, you know, sometimes Wednesdays work, sometimes Thursdays work. And I'm going to show this video here that I would like for everyone to watch. It's a short clip of one of the participants, and you can hear their narrative.
God made a mistake. God did trusted you with something that's so special. Um, and even though he wanted to do that he loved it, that yeah, um, that was something that I did um, and am doing. And um, I'm just glad to be in his face. Um, so my name is Tim. Traditional. So that was one of our participants um, in the parent the child <coughs> process. And with that, I will say she's just um, been amazing. And one thing that we teach is that it is important to harbor a relationship with individuals, whether in the home, as you learn, the unknown, someone that can tell you what to do, how to do, how to test. Because a lot of times when we go out for testing, we don't test until it's our birthday. I used to do it all the time when I was in high school. I'll wait till my birthday. But to have someone to tell you, you need to test on the regular and to educate them on stigma, on testing, and how to prevent HIV is very important within the home, as well as outside of the home and getting with families. And that is where we come up with Project Bo. And I hand it over to George for this one. Um, <clears throat> so, one of the things that I learned very early on uh, here at um, is that these people who present, these professors, these doctors, they basically are bragging about the things that they've been doing and the things that they do really well. And so, when I came up with my project, I thought, why not showcase and highlight what I've already been doing? Um, and, and sort of what I think is important and what I think is instrumental in fighting the epidemic, especially at home. So, um, yeah, my project is Project Vogue, which is obviously a, a spin on the House and Ball community. Um, and so I would like to first ask, who here has ever even heard of the House and Ball By show of hands. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So good, we good, we good. I'll actually still talk a little bit about it just so that folks know. Um, that the house and ball community is a, a very interesting uh, subculture within the African American sort of minority community. Um, it's, it's predominantly African American. However, we do encompass all folks, and so you'll have have uh, you know you'll have uh, Latinos, all folks of, of, of genders and gender expressions, and sort of there's these categories and sort of experience that will celebrate all the things that we are discriminated against as we're growing up. So the guys who want to dress up like girls who get teased for a category that celebrates that and affirms that identity and behavior. Um, and so I actually will play a short clip before I go into um, talking more about the ballroom scene. Hopefully you guys can hear. <laughs> I didn't expect this. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to roll with it. Uh, thank you, my brothers. Let's see what the rich people did. Or, you know, it would slap me in the face. I didn't have to have that because I never felt comfortable before. I just don't. Or even middle class doesn't suit me. Seeing the riches, seeing the way people are dying to see it. These huge houses. And I would think these people have 42 rooms in the house. Oh my God, what, what kind of a house is that? And we've got three. So why is it that they can have it? And I didn't. I always felt cheated. I always felt cheated out of things like that. We have space to do all that you intend to. Now the categories are Butch Queen 1 through 17 and for the girls 18 through 30. As far as all of y'all not walking, please realize that we all 
at one time or another have lusted to walk a ballroom floor. So give the patrons and the contestants, you know, a round of applause for nerves. Because with your vicious motherfuckers, it do take nerves. Believe me. We're not going to be shady, just fierce. Those balls are more that's like off actually of being a superstar or like the Oscars or whatever. Or being on a runway at mall. You know, a lot of those kids are in the balls, they don't have two of nothing. Some of them don't even eat. They come to ball star and they sleep in the under twenty one, but they sleep on a pier. They don't have a home to go to, but they'll make they'll go out and they'll steal something and get dressed up and come to a ball for them. I'm having a little bit of difficulties, but as you all can see, sort of that was a highlight from Harrison Burning. It sort of explains why ballroom culture is important, why it's desirable. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about myself for a second. Thank you, Naomi, for helping me out. Um, so growing up, as you can see, uh, the, the ballroom scene represents all of these things that disenfranchise people. It's not for them, right? We feel as though success isn't for us. We feel as though uh, achievement isn't for us. Even something as simple as school is not for us. Um, and so, the ballroom scene represents all of those things. We get to come to a space where we're celebrated for everything that we're not. It gives us a sense of pride, a sense of worth. Not to mention that there's a lot of money attached to some of these categories. And it can be, for some folks, it can not only just be a sense of celebrity, but can be a sense of survival. I know a lot of folks who use ballroom to, to not only pay their bills, but to uh, get from state to state and things like that. And so the, the, the community itself represents a family structure. Uh, there's this kinship. The houses are designed with mothers, fathers, like myself. I, I am a father, and so I oversee operations, but I also foster kids. I literally have had children stay in my house weeks on end uh, with, with, without expecting for them to pay me anything, pay me anything. Uh, and just knowing that they're my my youth that need to be uplifted and built because the the luxuries that I have been afforded and that I was given, not everyone else has. And so I'd like to share those luxuries with others. Um, the the barroom scene also represents ethnic and gender expression, right? So we have all these different spectrums of, of ethnicity all these different spectrums of genders um, and, and even identities. Some people will come to the ball as a boy and then when it's time for their category, we'll be a girl and then we'll go back to the other. Um, and so those interesting sort of intersections of, of identity are what we celebrate. Um, and so this slide right here just talks a little bit about um, the unemployment, the uh, uh, in Alameda County with as it relates to unemployment, the diagnosis rate, so the incidence rate as it applies to education level. And basically the reason why this slide is important is because it it will my program will address these needs. My program uh, is designed to give job skills to give professional development to give job opportunities to folks that are within the borrow. Um, and so who is, who is, and who is and what models Project Ball? I would say that I'm the, the representative, representative of the model of Project Ball. I had a very interesting childhood. Um, I came to the ballroom scene in 2003. I, I didn't have a job for like seven years, was completely okay with it. Um, had gone through some jail stuff, had gone through some uh, hardships with, within my own inner self uh, and just really had no plan, no sort of drive, no vision for what I wanted for the future. And somehow or another, 
the agency AIDS project with East Bay, which I'm still with now, found me. They, they decided they wanted to do this consulting project with me, and it turned into a part-time job, which then turned into a full-time job, which then turned into this, and has now brought me to where I am now. Um, but fortunately, I've had this social influence and this social status in the ballroom scene, which came long before me getting into this work. And um, it, it created a platform for me to be able to get people to actually make changes in their life and sort of what I'm going to talk about is how I came to the model of Project Vogue. And so Project Vogue is really modeled after two prevention projects that I developed uh, over the past two years. Um, both of them I have showcased at the U USCA, the United States Conference on AIDS, as well as uh, NASM conference. But I'm going to actually only highlight one because in the second time, so I, my, my Best yielding event, our best yielding results were from my Know Your Status Ball, which was in 2013. Um, I was able to bring in folks from all over the country. Um, in fact, folks came from actually the continent of Europe um, to my event. But I was able to get 220 participants uh, and spectators at my event. As a result of my event and my sort of tested test for a ticket model, I was able to get 67 individuals in the house and ball communities to who previously did not know their status to know their status. So the event obviously lived up to the name of getting folks to know their status. Um, and so I, I reached 220 individuals in 67 days. I had 41, or sorry, in 41 days, I had 67 folks screened or tested for either HIV or STD. I identified four new positives, uh, which gave me a 6% positivity rate overall. Um, 14 of the folks that were either tested or linked were either tested or relinked into care. Uh, we obviously achieved a greater sense of community and we were able to engage uh, and increase our outreach services. Uh, my event had layered testing. It had uh, incentives for engagement into services. It had incentives, incentives for ret retention um, and it also will be developed to create jobs, promote employment, and promote education. Um, and I'm actually partnering with CBOs to hopefully get them to adopt a model where they will take an employee, hire them at a part-time uh, position, and hopefully develop them into a full-time position and eventually let them develop. Um, and so this is some of the services that I'll provide in Project Bow. We'll have uh, GED courses, we'll have job skills training, uh, again, CBO affiliated hiring, um, and we'll be using surveys to, to uh, gauge sort of what the services of the community are or what they want to, want to do. Um, and this will be locally tailored, so all of the local ballroom scene will plan and implement these uh, programs. Um, and so I'm going to go to the very end because we are done. And so I just want to say thank you very, very much to everyone, um, especially the Black AIDS Institute staff, Phil Wilson, for giving us this opportunity. It's been amazing. I could not have done this without my colleague and best friend, Cameron. And so thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Questions for the panel? All right. Um, I love how you guys um, implemented your personal story into the presentation. That was really awesome. I loved the piece you put in with the mother, and it made me like feel really emotional because I could never, I couldn't imagine ever telling my mother or father. You know, I mean, they they may know or whatever, but I couldn't imagine actually telling them. And I wish there was some way that I can have that talk with them so they can um, accept me because I know that they won't accept me that way. So I'm, that was a good job. I like that. And just a random question. Um, I saw the LGBTQ2IA. What is that? I thought it was a typo. Then you said. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, intersex and uh, two sex. What is it? And they required us to put it on. Okay. I'm like, yeah, it's, right. it's some progressive terms. Yes, it's, it's some very progressive uh, California. Yes. Sort of my collaborators. You're trying to be PC. Yeah. We're trying to be inclusive. We're working on our inclusivity. Yeah. I don't want to leave anybody out.
yeah so you guys did a great job i think the personal aspect like josh was saying is helps folks to relate more you know because you know you can kind of talk about numbers and data but like when you say like your story like i know like i respond well to that so i appreciate you guys sharing your stories um yeah it was a good presentation so has vogue already been implemented because you said it will be implemented George, right? Is, is that what I heard? Okay. So, yes and no. Um, okay. Doing it. it just was not called Project Vogue. It wasn't okay. quite a program. Um, for the sake of these hand, I de decided to use what I had already been doing um, and sort of showcase the model for for which and what Project Vogue was surrounded around. Okay. So, yes. <laughs> You guys did a really good job. Um, you guys have a good presentation style. Um, and you did a really good job. It was great. Um, and I really love that you guys would uh, present like the project, but then you also went back and presented data as to why it's important, right? You talked about uh, the new diagnoses amongst young people. I think you talked about like, all the different like, ways to like that. Like, not things like that. So I thought that was really good. I love, I love when people link programming to data. You guys did an awesome job. Um, I have a question about how you guys plan to move forward with the BTN. I know you guys have a BTN that is not all the way formed, um, but you guys are kind of picking things up and picking up new numbers as well, which is good. Forward, what ways do you want the BTN to support these two projects? I know that you guys talked about the two different, like you talked about um, student education and well, we have a lot of faith-based, we have two faith-based organizations that are part of the B10 that are well represented. And that's going to really help with the parent and the child in the process with kind of putting in some um, curriculum, like spiritual curriculum to it um, that a lot of parents want to see. And then also with Project Vogue, they really help provide a space and it really shows a being inclusive because a lot of times people look at the ballroom scene as an alternative um, church style, fellowshipping style. So it's kind of like the mixing the two. And that's another thing that we added into the curriculum is looking at the ballroom scene as an alternative fellowship style to church and celebration. And so trying to bridge those two, um, those two entities and institutions together so that's how we're working with our b10 and like making more collaborations with other cbo's and CBIs. and i think too just to point out that i think the two of us are really really positioned we have like great networks um, and so we have like sort of the keys to to open right and so we can <laughs> literally just make one phone call like i'm i'm very close to the club owner I'm very close to the CBO uh, executive directors. So, you know, and we actually work at the number one agency for black folks in uh, in the Alameda County. So we're, we're positioned to, to do exactly whatever it is, exactly what we need to do, whatever that is and whatever it will take to get there. We've also been able to work with um, some principals at uh, Realm, Castlemont, as well as BYA, and we've been able to go in there and that helps us get a lot of young people to our meetings and to our trainings. And it's really, we've had a, an increase of um, information about HIV treatment and all of that um, by 60%, yeah, from their pre and post tests. Yeah. Congratulations, you guys did a great job. Thank you. Oh yeah, also, Jill, I loved your um, thing and how you, you were able to reach so many people and it was great that you find those 40 positive people that's important, of course. But, um, I know you guys' presentation was great. I know you didn't have time to talk about everything because of limited um, space, limited time. But can you just talk about your um, what, what you guys did for the IV trainings, like the first couple of yeah, trainings? Yeah. Also, we did also our, your successes and challenges during the IV fellowship. Cool, cool, cool. So our uh, uh, thank, you, thank you, thank you, thank you, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Josh. You got our back. So our two day training, we 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 kind of condensed it into a two day training. Um, I can't remember exact ages, but I know it was between like 13 and 21. There were young youth. Um, and we, as he said, we had huge uh, improvement in t pre and post test scores as it related to HIV um, information. But I want to point out a real life story. So we literally, one day, were like getting ready 
and there were two sisters, older sister and younger sister. And the older sister says to the younger sister, uh, Cameron and George told me about um, HIV uh, birth control and that there's this pill and stuff. And she like snapped back at her and was like, girl, we learned about that three months ago. She was like, I didn't know about that. So, so it was so interesting to see the little sister like schooling the big sister. Uh, and so we, we really have a great time uh, with the kids and, and the impact that we have with the kids is, is transcends across across the board. We used um, our focus was um, HIV um, prevention, and then we also did stigma, and then we also did substance use, and um, it was very successful. The only challenge it seemed like it was a challenge at the time to get the youth present, but then when we showed up, it was full both days. It was full both days. And so that seemed like a challenge, but then in the end, it I think the only challenge that we ever face is just us being too gay. Like we are, we're obviously gay, and so we come into spaces with, that are very inclusive, that have people that are of all um, gender, or not gender, but of all sexuality identity. And so we we oftentimes judge ourselves when we walk into these spaces, and we put more pressure on ourselves than we need to. The moment that me and Cameron open our mouths, kids love us, and we get to have a bad experience. And so I don't really think we have any challenges other than our own self doubt. That's something that I won't go away and that won't Any questions from the larger group? No. Questions or comments? Me, but, but a comment. I, I think you guys did, did a great job. And I've heard both of those stories. I think before we're doing the office training, but every time it gets right here. Um, for both of you guys to join and, and thanks for sharing that because it, it just makes a big difference. Um, and I think you have to go through it. Um, but it, it just makes a big difference. I really appreciate it. And I would just like to say I was fighting back tears because you were really true to being that person that you wish you had. And even though your programs are slightly different, you're really doing the same thing, which is bringing about a transformation instead of sweeping issues under the rug, you're actually confronting them and transforming them in the actual, you know, biological thing. And you're cre creating a transformation by creating these familiar type, familial types among in the ball thing. So I think you're doing great work. Your enthusiasm shows I, I just, I'm so proud of you all, and you gave me some ideas in terms of BTAN. I love the fact that your BTAN is so diverse, because mine isn't established, but I was thinking along the lines of ASO, you know, the usual suspects, but I just love it, it reminded me when you reach out to all of these, that's how you qualify it. Everybody is absolutely sensitive. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> then, uh, so speaking about uh, your program, Cameron, as we tap into, uh, I would say, the youth that have been in your program. Yes, definitely. At the same time, I took the advice of the class from the last session because I was asking questions about how do I get just like totally against it that um, the students have been um, ostracized or the youth have been ostracized. Um, I watched my approach. You know, I took the advice to the class and I watched my approach and I made sure that when approaching it, making sure that the individual wants the relationship with the child. And all the time they do. They really don't want from the child. Although it seems like when I'm talking to the youth um, from the first um, focus group, there were two in particular that did not, that felt like their parents did not want them around at all. So their counselor re reached out to them and had a meeting with them. And it ended up being the opposite. It's just that they didn't know how to acknowledge it or address it. And they were three individuals that ended up saying, well, when it was brought up, <clears throat> I just shut down and decided not to converse about it because I don't know how to 
talk about it and I'm worried that I may make things worse. Anything else? Did you say the average school is the age group? You may have, but I'm just interested to know, like, what's your average? I went for 13 to 24, and the individuals that showed up were 15 to 19. Thank you guys so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And everyone that is streaming live, good afternoon. Good morning to you guys as well. My name is Charles Pettiford, and I am with B10 Nashville. I was, I used to live in Atlanta, Georgia. I used to resign with B10 Atlanta, but now I'm officially moved to Nashville, Tennessee, and I work with Streetworks as the HBCU Outreach Coordinator. And what I do is I make focus groups around what the black MSM population on the HBCU campuses as TSU, Fisk, and Meharry would like to see on the campus. So I titled it Reformation because there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the um, Nashville, Tennessee, and also the linkage to care and also the abandonment of care is lack. So dealing with the Dallas statewide, um, I did it statewide first. 
if you look at the numbers by race, it's 336 male, which is 56.5% that are black. I know this is HIV um, disease case in uh, Tennessee in 2014. Um, also, white, non Hispanic, it was also 201. So, my main focus with my job is that we also tend to the black community, but the white, non Hispanic is also at the rise as well. statewide uh, data on base where we looked at the collective over the whole Tennessee state and we saw that the uh, male to male or MSM that have sex with men is 434 and we also said the bisexual men among male to man was 71 which stood at 72.9 percent Davidson County I took the chart that we focus on more. And we looked at the chart with the male to male sexual intercourse, which is 38, um, 38 um, whites and also 67. And also bisexual, we had 18 when it came to blacks that's not Hispanic. So the uh, B10, the Black Treatment Advocacy Network, I focused on treatment and education and advocacy, focused on bringing to Nashville, Tennessee. Um, so the B10 overview, uh, my mission that I want to bring is to serve as an educator or an opinion leader in the um, their communities and also increase the um, early um, appropriate treatment and also improve treatment of hearings in black communities. Um, that is the biggest um, downfall in Nashville, Tennessee. We have people that would not like to take their meds um, and also stay linked into care. Uh, we have people that fall off and they will like to turn back in like two years later or three years later. Um, also my goals, I would like to do help link and retain people living with the HIV, um, HIV and AIDS into the appropriate care and treatment and also improve access to and quality of care in their home communities. Um, there also has been talks where there have been many people focusing saying that their um, providers wasn't treating them all right. Um, they said that they weren't asking them the right certain questions that they needed. Um, and they also felt like they was blaming them for what they had. So building Nashville B10. Um, so what, what makes it interesting about this development is that it allowed me to move to Nashville and do a one day training with my job and also with different uh, CBOs, the health department, to just see where everybody's mind's at, to see if they also heard about the Black Ace Institute, um, which a lot of people said that they heard about Black Ace Institute, and I know they said that they heard about the prep summit that was supposed to come, but then once I got there, I actually made it happen. Um, so the future partnerships that I see with the B10 chapter is Streetworks um, Project Uno and also FRC. We're all combined together. Um, also, Planned Parenthood, Tennessee State, and Fitch University. I use those because of some facts. They're my main grounds to getting the students involved with the B10 chapter. Um, also, with me working with those two um, campuses will be a, a good lead to bring in more of the um, leaders and people to focus on the B10 chapter. I also did Vanderbilt because they was one of the program um, people that helped me with the B uh, the prep summit and also the health department as well. So the B10 training, like I said, the first training was a one day, not a science and treatment, but it was just basically letting my employees know what was B10, um, what was the Black Ace Institute, what was the AHU Fellowship, what I was dealing with. Um, so a lot of them was very interested um, into knowing. I told them about the biomedical science that we um, did. I also told them about community mobilization. Um, so it was very interesting. Um, I had also the prep summit as well um, with Erica. And this is actually applied on some of the people that came to, um, to the community as well. Um, I had 30 that showed up. Um, it was last minute, um, very hectic schedule, uh, running back and forth. 
but at least 30, 35 people showed up. Um, they was very engaging. They opened up more than I expected. Um, they had great uh, dialogue. They also had great conversations when it came to the um, black mistrust with the uh, doctors and uh, the providers as well. And they also had a lot of questions for Erica when it came down to B10 and um, bringing a B10 chapter to Nashville. Um, so my project plan is my problem uh, statement is the lack of retention and treatment of newly diagnosed clients within Davidson County. I deal with the youth on uh, the black um, MSM population. So a lot of them that come to me are newly diagnosed with HIV or they are dealing with the process of someone that is uh, being diagnosed. So when it comes to that, they tell me that they don't want to go to their providers due to lack of information that their providers provide them with. Um, like for instance, if they're negative PrEP, they didn't know anything about PrEP. Um, a lot of people was asking what was PrEP when it came to the PrEP sign. Uh, we also did mistrust and we saw their views on how they feel that the black community is being represented when it came to Nashville. Um, also, one of my goals that I wanted to do is, like I said, help link and retain people living in, um, with HIV into um, appropriate care and treatment. And with that, I plan to do a eight-week intervention. Um, it's called The Lesson of Growing Pains. Um, the Lesson of Growing Pains came from a series that I started on Facebook um, with me being diagnosed since 2014 with HIV. I wanted to give back to the community. Um, I didn't want to just sit in my home, just be quiet and cry all the time, mope around and be hurt. I wanted to use that pain and anger that I had to make it all uh, work in the community. Um, so my objectives will be the community part on partnerships uh, with all the um, ASL CEOs and also the health department partnerships. There has been a little bit of black communication with the health departments there um, due to the lack of information and also the lack of, I think, training when it comes to dealing with the black community um, in Nashville. Um, also, I did my outputs of what I feel that will be best for this actual to um, plan to um, be um, successful is a health and well, uh, wealth uh, training. Also, life coaches and an eight-week uh, intervention, like I said, the um, like, um, lessons of growing pain. Um, I think life coaches work as well because I have a lot of people that tell me that they are dealing with a lot of problems. They're dealing with a lot of situations, uh, family abandonment, um, also dealing with um, friends that abandon them because they're dealing with HIV. Um, they are afraid to even get their medicine sent to the schools um, because they know that once the medicine get there, they know what their um, peers are going to say. So like I said, the lesson of growing pains is the eight-way intervention. The target population is going to be the black youth ages 18 through 26, also the MSM population. Um, my purpose is to bring awareness to the black community um, as well and also to build on uh, trust within. Because I feel like if you don't have trust within yourself, you can't be able to trust the process or build a relationship with yourself to um, know that you can take it up a level and be the advocate that you want to be. Um, so my process and outcome evaluations, to do this, I'm going to form like a red cap database um, that I'm going to be working with with the uh, Tennessee State and also Fish uh, University of Meharry. And what we're going to do is we're going to go on the campuses and ask um, different questions and um, also how they feel um, when it comes to hear the topic of PrEP or hear the topic of HIV or anything that goes around the topic of that. We just want to see where everyone's head is at and also what we need to bring. Um, not only with just B10, we also wanted to see what I can do as an individual to make people more open um, to communication because the communication is very lacking there in Nashville. Um, so successes in, um, in the AHU um, Fellowship, I can say that without the AHU Fellowship, I will not be doing the work that I'm doing now. Um, I've traveled so many different places. I've presented so many places and I also started working in Nashville. 
Um, and I think that that was the biggest journey for me because when I did the interview, the man looked at me and he said, oh, you're the one from the Black AIDS Institute. I want you. And I was like, okay, like no interview. So it was, it was real exciting for him to say, I looked at your resume and I saw the Black AIDS Institute and I just want you because I think that you'll do great work. And um, the downfalls that I see is that I think it's a lot of communication uh, failures, um, not just only on um, my side, but um, also in general, um, just dealing with a lot of things stressfully with the community, um, as in trying to build a B10. It's real stressful because some people will say that they want to, and then they'll actually back out. Um, you'll send an email, they'll say like, yes, they'll come to the meeting, and then the next thing you know, they're gone. Um, so in my conclusion, I can truly say that the next steps that I'm doing is that I'm working with Erica now and making the B10 whole, um, and also communicating with all the people that came to the prep summit. Um, to see who's interested in serving as a uh, co-chair on one of the uh, committees as well. Um, and I also want to actually get that eight-week um, intervention incorporated with B10 um, because I think that it's something that the black community can use as whole, um, as a whole with the, you have to understand that you are a lesson with the pains that you go through. Um, and with those pains comes success. And um, so you had mentioned that some of the downfalls um, to actually building the BTN would be communication failures and kind of like people juggling a whole lot and making BTN a priority. What? are you planning to do to address those? Um, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, my biggest thing is to get myself known in Nashville because that was the biggest thing with the prep summit. Um, a lot of people didn't know me well enough to say, okay, I will come to the prep summit. I actually had to build a connection with my coworkers to say, hey, can you send this flyer out to your connections? Can you talk to them and let them know that this is a program that I want to bring to Nashville? Um, so it was very hard for that. But since now, people have been seeing my face and seeing the work that I do and also came to the prep summit. Now people are like, oh, I want to know more. I'm interested in learning. So my whole agenda now is to just focus on all set that are willing to work it out and um, be a part of B10 that, and go with the uh, flow. Um, I also believe in just what is right versus um, leaving people um, behind um, because leaving people behind could be also be a success for you, um, not only with the B10 chapter that I want to build, but also with the community as a whole because they may be a barrier to me reaching to the community. Questions or comments from the group as well? Hey, Charles. <laughs> I just want to say you did a really good job, and um, I definitely can relate to you as far as the frustrations of trying to you know, be impactful for me to be true. But um, I just want to give some words of encouragement because we started out together. You yes. Know, and, um, yeah. You moved, and that's a great thing. But to see you, you know, standing on your own and, you know, presenting your information, your vision, I, I think you're going to do some amazing things. Just know that you're not anybody even though I'm still in it, you can still call me, and uh, I'm still excited for you too. But uh, just keep up the good work, man. Be encouraged. And I want to commend you as well because to actually move during this fellowship and go to an area where you don't have any social capital and still be able to use your resources was is wonderful. And even if you got thirty, that's great. Because you can pull, you can use that pep summit to kind of buttress into. And that's given you more profile. Yeah. It makes people know you. And so now you're in a good position to reach out and make those connections. So just continue to do the great work. 
Thank you. Well. Great job. <laughs> All right, so we are going to break for lunch. We're a bit early. And then we start our next presentation, I think, at 1 o'clock. I think one of our
way he's trying to. Well, did you not just go last? And I said, no, no, but trying to. Good afternoon. Uh, my name Good is Keith Hughes. I am a native from Detroit, Michigan. Um, I've been working in the field of HIV since 2006. Um, I've been employed with ACC Ball Unified since 2008, formerly known as AIDS Partnership Michigan. Um, I've been working in the field of prevention actually since I started. So I pretty much have done everything there is except for case management services. Um, born and raised in Detroit, uh, and I not only serve a uh, certain community, but I am also a part of the community, which is the most amazing community. Good afternoon. My name is Quentin Straw. I'm also a native Detroiter. I've been working, started volunteering in HIV in 2008. Um, I graduated from high school in Detroit in 1981, which was also the same year that HIV was identified and started to be publicized. I perform. HIV has been a part of my life the whole time. Um, I work for the uh, Wayne State University Physicians Group Infectious Disease Clinic. I also work for uh, Dell Wellbeing Services, both of them as peer support uh, specialist and peer navigator. I'm also a member of the Michigan HIV AIDS Planning Council. I chair the Needs Assessment Committee, so we look at how the epidemic has been progressing and things that we can do to address it. And part of this presentation, we'll talk about some of the things that even though we look at the numbers, HIV, there's some things that aren't obvious that we need to be addressing also. So looking at, looking at um, the summary of the, our needs assessment findings, just looking at Southeast Michigan, six county region, and that six county region is 4.6 million residents approximately. Uh, six percent of white collar, have white collar jobs, medium income is about $1,000, but in Detroit, we lost a lot of our population. We've gone down to so, um, all right, we're going to go ahead and get and started with BTN Jackson. Uh, so, Black. welcome everyone, we and um, it's all yours. All right, good evening, everyone. Oh, we're welcome back to the Detroit. We are BTN Jackson, and the illiteracy rate in Detroit. Um, first of all, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm talking to me. School systems are going through right now because corruption issues and the things that have been watching the news, it's all over the place. So basically, it's become a big problem and it affects health care and how people are. And it's down to the street office. We have a way that they view themselves in the health care system. We have two in the book called South. We have a South. Again, I'm going to give you an office manager for it. Uh, um, I've been working on ACL every year, roughly almost two million. Uh, uh, but the uh, epidemic lies actually inside. Back in Detroit. Yeah, Tim Ryan, I've been doing this company about right here. Uh, about 400,000 people. I was first exposed to HIV. Change my life later on, but these are individuals who 
may not be well, one. I'm just uh, just in pay um, outreach uh, specialist for uh, my brother's sexual uh, 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 category. Yes. Sexual category. I got you to this child yes. field about a year ago. It was uh, always was a passion to advocate and, 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 uh, and uh, you know, be a voice for others who didn't have a voice and see. I always be the vast majority. Uh, uh, when I got deeper, it into says uh, pretty much Martin sixty-five. And older, but I think this was the kind of plays a part of the. Uh, uh, the uh, I, so I learned how can we put about all the good <laughs> care along with, with those who are some of the biased expressions that I have with the field of being able to and so it's not here now, but it's part of the infection. We all know that that age range is somewhere between. Okay, so we're gonna get started to about. I'm going to basically give you a summary of the uh, needs of in Mississippi. Um, Mississippi is uh, about 3 million people strong. Um, not a big website, but which is addressing those that are about 37% have been uh, uh, with HIV. And um, people that have been uh, diagnosed and also aware of the HIV. About 21%, uh, which is part of the property level in the most whole, updated uh, data that there is. But it's um, an HIV state of all of those 10,000. It's about 8,753 people living with HIV in the state of Mississippi. The number of people that have been diagnosed. Um, about 536 were newly diagnosed in 2013. And the number of people that have been about um, 68 percent of people living with HIV, HIV um, that are diagnosed in 2012 are um, a little over 4,000. Uh, 73 percent um, of people pattern, living with HIV, uh, diagnosed total number of people that have been well, engaged in care is in the uh, um, almost 171 percent of HIV cases. For my main number, for males who have been received HIV medical in 2012. Um, HIV HIV cases in women were about 2,600, about 82%. So, 15% were from injection and drug density. So, as we kind of see here, as far as um, those men men have like medical care and also um, (coughs) case for the biggest problem with HIV. Living with HIV, HIV I do not have a AIDS diagnosis um, who has not received. Medical uh, this medical time of year, what I was just talking about, like um, the um, seventeen hundred, which is about three million people in this community, um, um, about thirty six percent of the African American who are as you can see, black, white, Caucasian, Asian, 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 the right uh, race as far as individuals who are living in the city okay, of Detroit. So, oh my God! Uh, either occupy a rental housing unit, where the rent capital in Mississippi is thirty five percent or more. Number ten in the nation for African Americans. Thank you. And, American 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 and uh, Mississippi was right number one in the nation for and they say the majority of. Um, and I saw data from the um, majority of the percentage due to the fact that the South has the highest diagnosis of HIV and AIDS pertaining to the income of the poor in Mississippi. And also, how it's about 9,000 people living with HIV. Um, the employment rate in, um, in alone, some of the HIV prevention needs um, crazy. With it's crazy. Teaching, uh-huh. um, what we call it's three and eight point nine voices is a point where it kind of itself is seventy six. So Detroit and um, most of that number. We noticed that it's a it's a needed more incentive to try to people um tend not to come out or not uh, or want to lie yeah. if you don't have anything to give them financials. And um the more you have to give them, the more the better the turnout. There's and also, um, individuals who may be engaged in it. In Mississippi, it's a lot of people without transportation. Um, so, yeah, that was it. Um, two provisions, more um, transportation, more people as far as me, who have to give people rides to um, Here is prevention a and intervention. Big gap. And also, uh, yeah. more funding overall because it's not very many programs so can that are paying the for prevention and housing assistance. Uh, employment um, opportunities. We also feel um, that we also need uh, HIV um, literacy, HIV services, and educational programs amongst the African American MSM community. Um, 
stay retained in care. Is it and also food, uh, food emergency assistance program. So, um, um, transgender uh, women of color. They, uh, that's the biggest issue we get in, a, in the city. We feel that African American and MSMs within the age of that. That is the biggest issue. And uh, mainly is mainly due to the lack of education. Um these numbers there's really by no their peers and their peers are not giving them the right information. Um stigma, of course, we all deal with stigma issues. The biggest issue that we've been facing is that they've been compiling both the data for more men that sex and over stigma and trans women of color up under one. And um rural health issues so we know what we've done here. Oh trans women. Due to the data we found, we feel that Mississippi needs adequate education about HIV and life cycle, biomedical innovation and prevention and our AIDS council. We're not looking at Separating that data for trans women and MSMs. We just finished right, our one set of training surveys and we're working on our second set. Um, and this set is going to address our, uh, trans women. Internships and things like that. We're also going to have some folks. First, um, that. We haven't compiled that data yet. What we basically did was so we combined all of our trying to start building some data for the mouth training. We did go back, we did research, we did have a None of this has anything to do with uh, it. Uh, 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 these could very well be people um, that we found is that um, was 19, was 19, was 19, they believe that they have no risk factors on the way. And also uh, offered like, uh, a lot of women that are in care are not, uh, a lot of women are not in care. A lot of women are not receiving adequate care and they also uh, care for being by risk pressure. There's more numbers we need to separate. We're going to do that. These are the pictures from our training. You can see, um, we have Christopher Manning. 30 percent of women that our mission statement. Um, some of the challenges we face were um, um, is that we have a great turnout, however, that can contribute to the um, our mission statement, which we have focused on, which are issues that, like I said, we face in the city, which are individuals, which I've experienced personally with working in the community and also being a part of the LGBT community. May not have a place to stay. Um, we have a lot of issues with financial. Um, she works with our agency, our brother's keeper. He's a program for the next year. So they have a strength of a temporary issue. Dabble in commercial sex work or escort. Um, and I also, even though they don't like to have that type of conversation, conversation the realization um, around the Conference Jackson to do on the Bell I'm a commercial sex worker and I'm providing staff sex for me to be able to survive from day to day. If I meet someone that wants to pay me for sex, I'm going to be able to do it. Unfortunately, I'm faced with some of the dirty health problems that is most science and treatment. If I don't have any money or I don't have anywhere to stay, I'm going to be able to do it. 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 That falls apart as well. Future five in Mississippi is the uh, place for provide commercial sex work. High rates of HIV and STDs are in areas. There's three different areas in the area where we're not sex number two. That's where I'm actually higher. Which is in the Department of Park area, which I use the word Christmas. Either Midwest Sex Women or Midwest Sex Women. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we have sex with women that are doing that. And we
referral services for other, other oh, that's it. That's the yeah. um, and, and also, look at, during the intervention at the end, we will also give um, a special things. We want to know exactly what we need to improve so in and also what um, aspects um, that you think uh, is still, still, other still to doing. So, so they're not getting research that. that we can bring in more members for B10. And also bring in more evidence to fresh awareness of HIV. And I think the number one thing that we definitely are trying to do with the Kent Detroit with this part here. Some of the sense in I a lot of these organizations that provide something um, due to the fact that uh, there's no uh, I started out in, in college then it's and visible to the community. The accident I had that to are now, maybe this has actually built more momentum for me to go back to and Wait, because it, they, 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 they don't know. You sit out for so long, you so, tend to think that, oh, I can't do this. We're I was trying to sell. I was trying to find some type of way. But I with that gap people that are, to well, my fellow organizations, um, my classmates has motivated to build a better relationship with the community, community so where the community can feel be like or, they can well, go to these places to receive services. I have them. gained so much from size or being everybody because they don't have, you know, even talking. Um, this has so, been like um, I will say it has been that our project areas for B10 and Troy. We're going to be looking at uh, uh, patient navigation, which is increasing the visibility of people actually engage those. You know, not even only can show you the infection. And it has come a passion for me to uh, get out. Me personally, I don't want to necessarily look you know, at great awareness for everybody. Just those that are that I look at and also that are friends. And, friends. That are and I know I can give a yeah. hand. I feel like overjoyed. And to be honest, I think it's one of my calls. I, uh, I you know, coming in this lifestyle, don't I have kind of type of um, got it in I, I, I got a place I can go without. And with this, I have. Like really size to and my to where they can actually elevate and increase their own and, uh, and their own doing this. I have really, really, you know, just so with this. I'm, I'm shocked. The organizations that we work with, I really, I, I, I'm so overwhelmed. I made it to graduation, and just to hear someone say, "I'm proud of you," like I haven't had a relationship with my father, but for him to call me and tell he's proud of me. It's a so really great opportunity to get out and do some public to the community. It's a real life. My sister, like I said, when I look at the courses they need, we have to stay But I do, I don't think I would give you the information. Like I said, I don't want the information. During our BTN targets reducing rate of um, what we did was uh, here. my agency unified actually collaborated with um my uh, awesome assistant uh, uh, I don't want to sound cliche and say I appreciate the boot camp which I did get and it was extremely extremely just not being that we have been able to take back to our community we have been able to you know touch people in and say people with the information that we received but um, I think also, um, the important part of the thing is what I see is just being able to show uh, the employment and how it's supposed to be. Network. Network. I build bonds and connections yeah. with people all over the United yeah. States. Yeah. They have yeah. never yeah. lose yeah. uh, efforts. Yeah. They, um, yeah. I know that I have yeah. so many people that yeah. I always can call on. I have questions. Yeah. I always got yeah. BA yeah. out of college. Yeah. Um, yeah. Am I getting yeah. off the yeah. email? Yeah. The yeah. introduction yeah. 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 So, instead of looking at this, is just something it, it's just really been a privilege. Like I said, I, I got a job, and then I was yeah, talking about yeah, coming to LA it's been the same week. And, and um, really I didn't take it, um, I didn't take it lightly, you know what I'm saying? And um, also, with this, I was told that um, my passion well, is not uh, sure. part of the team to be part but, of the people um, that are in important I have positions in the city that make, make the decision. We have a thing so, called the Homosexual Network of Detroit. Yeah, 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 we yeah, need somebody yeah, to be a part of that organization. My passion is to decide what happens to those thousand dollars. 
Um, so I'm in the conclusion. Uh, and, um, uh, and, um, uh, 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 really is um, that we are going to during our first internship. We actually as we're as going to get the next job that provides, and we are going to to the community. Um, we're going to further engage our input uh, and what we know uh, to our <laughs> community that we have actually had the coming to um, explain. Explain to them that exactly um, show yeah, awareness to they actually have built some kind of um, through what our issues are in the community as we are actually um are going to come together and and medical care and also um, close to our even more brainstorm a little closer um, because we, we actually have uh, actually uh, reached out to and one thing I will say is we've grown to know each other a little bit better and department just co work. Like I can uh, call and, uh, and and just have the help, and we can get on the phone and make a plan. And because one thing I will say, we might have had a little stumble, um, but when we actually came together. We all had the same passion and drive. Yeah, lots of people that don't get and information. As long as we have that, I know that we can be, we can succeed. Be able to do everything that we do, and also we have our. Um, well, which is my good dad on the show. Yeah, the board and also the organization. And also, more family and friends that you believe in. The time, not necessarily the time frame, but. That is the end of our getting everyone into one room to actually have a dialogue due to the work. Oh, sure. I love it. 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 What I'd like to know is, what do you think are some of the challenges that's kind of here that's coming to us? I'm trying to balance everything out. Oh, wow. Um, one of the main challenges for me right now is in the development of Healthy Emergency Lifeline Program Unified in Ocean. That was like, you've already built relationships with a challenge for me because agencies. You know, I haven't been in school at almost four in a part of these hands. And to come down, mom rushing me like that, it was really nervous. Or like I, I think I would have been like he really helped me to focus more on the house, but and that was one of the major challenges. The other challenge we already have on email blast. So whenever anything or anything is going on at times for us during the development, them across what's going on because here we are on the big So it was kind of hard for us. We were pushing it, but. Sometimes I didn't have it, but it's always a summon to me. Okay, go ahead, because you know, it's going to be all right. You're going to like it. So, I mean, so when we do that, that, that was my job. Really we do it was kind of hard, but I mean, I stay strong. I the health department are pretty close working with each other. One of my challenges, probably, like I said, I'm a quiet person. HIV. I'm kind of coming out of this oh, world. I'm not used to really working with work from the work with stuff around Southeast Michigan. People, I'm used to doing everything myself. So, they want to be part of the like, like, conversation. I have to learn to trust people, open up so more, talk, trust my feelings, things like that. This is not one of the project areas. It's also in that thing. I don't know. My biggest challenge was mainly like Bill said. I'm like, a solo solo type of person. I work with those. I don't really know the um, no communication. My ideas and my thoughts with them. I have like 50 different things going on. It's a convey convey the message is being difficult. So they took the precepts. That was probably my biggest challenge. I was like, you start providing a little bit. You know, it's going to have longer than so it kind of raised the red flag for us uh, as far as the um, the education that the state is providing. Congratulations on finishing. Um, you can tell it's been a journey and it's been a process. And I'm glad to be the beginning the difference. The trainers from the state as well. So thank you guys for sharing. Uh, so, um, so my only question is, uh, so if you had so to do the first to again, what would you do? Because you work with us every day, you think, oh, I got this. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I need to find out about this. So it was good to see what they were interested um, in and reflecting their, their education about what's happening. I went down myself as much as I did. So, I, 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 I was in my biggest um, by the services 
the oh, organizations they provide and the lack of visibility. It's because I've been, been told so many times organizations have not the community and this part, I feel like so many organizations have like community members. That's the only thing I wish community members as it relates to building a rapport with the community itself. With the you can't help your last moment. I would put together your HIV positive. You can still be made. We can help you with providing some type of resource. Yeah, that was never great for me. I'm not going to lie to you. Like, I like lost my mind. I was, yeah, they felt like I was trying to. Yeah, I got it back. I'm like, I'm there. How that's going to look. You know, my main, as it relates to. Me getting so here with uh, having a focus with, with community members. And at the community. time, not seeing something in front of you, it yeah, kind of throws you off. So I'm like, okay. Uh, with, with the knowledge of the service out there, as well as well, it's all worked out, pretty close down. They may have had all these organizations to why they may not want to. It's a little more why they don't have any knowledge about these organizations. Any more questions? With this WCCCD. Oh, Wayne County I'm District. It was founded 50 years ago. Yeah. Uh, uh, inside the city of Detroit, and they really built up a lot of really good programs for nursing, uh, hazmat, pharmaceuticals, things like that. They have a large African American young youth and and into this list. <laughs> We do have a couple of institutions education to on the map mass to that was really just felt important. Just getting we haven't actually made the contacts that we need with them yet, but that is definitely I'm getting our information. I actually had to build the relationship with that organization actually with one of the employees, which is the uh, employee that's ready to he actually goes into the field and he actually assists with community with uh, resume building and he actually goes out into the community and finds uh, jobs for these individuals. They're not HIV positive, they're actually helping individuals obtain jobs and uh, they actually can stacks of uh, 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 individuals who are uh, who end up gaining employment and also retaining employment over a six month six month period. So we definitely want to keep this relationship uh, the happy program that is a program tailored to uh, individuals who are living with HIV. Right, here's them. Therein lies the issue. The HAP program is the housing and It's supposed to be a short term stop that program. However, there have been issues with people staying on that program for a number of years because they're not moving into other different things like the employment and the housing. They've started with a couple of their employees working with us building employment skills and everything so that they can move off the program. So Happy is now looking at some of those we introduced the program to so and they're looking at building some relationships with outside organizations and those going to other house situations.
uh, why there's no outreach efforts as far as uh, information provided to the community, as far as services they provided for those that are HIV positive and also those that are at risk of HIV. Um, also, increasing the visibility of unmet needs in the community to better increase access to non medical care services for those affected and affected with HIV. Um, establishing a connection with other partners uh, to increase the immediate needs of services. So, our objective is to ensure that clients are gaining proper services and uh, advocating for services uh, in our area. So right here, this uh, this is just pretty much a description of one of the project areas we'll be focusing on, which is patient navigation. The, like I said, the name of uh, you, the name of our program, which is the Holistic Health Project, which we'll be targeting um, at, uh, 50 MSMs, transgender one, uh, persons of color, and high risk heterosexual men. Uh, pretty much to engage with assessing their needs and also referring them to non-medical services um, regards to their HIV status. So the purpose is, uh, of this project is to assist with the navigation of client services to non-medical services to increase the engagement of overall client care. Uh, the second project area, which is advocacy, uh, which we're going to, which the target population is still the same, which is MSM trans, one, uh, trans person of color and high risk of sexual um, the objective is to establish at least five memorandum uh, of understandings or agreements with organizations that provide either employment or housing uh, services to increase service process for those that are HIV positive and those that are at risk. We have some issues going on with uh, people being able to access those services for training, employment training, and education when those services are tied to federal dollars. And we now have uh, medical marijuana is, is legal in the state of Michigan. Uh, so with that, they can't access federal dollars if they, even if they have a marijuana card, right? So you can't get any of that training. You can't get, get any of that employment assistance or any of that. So working with the uh, substance abuse uh, agencies is gonna be key to getting the people to understand that for a, at least a short time, you might have to be absent and stay clean in order to avail yourself of something better in your future. So with that, with the process of us actually building a BCN chapter, uh, we are still currently working on these assessments based upon the knowledge of services available in the community. Uh, this is solely based on, like I said, the lack of knowledge of services that are available and also the efforts of these organizations providing um, providing some type of marketing material to the community as far as services that are provided. So that's one thing definitely we're going to be working on to address and also increasing um, increasing capacity around the referral service um, the, referral, the referral service and requirements of these organizations of those that are able to accept uh, ex uh, get services from these organizations. Uh, the process and outcome evaluation. So when we do these uh, outreach events, we'll use the pre and post test. We'll use surveillance data from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. We'll have evaluation forms at these events and I want to increase uh, high risk heterosexuals requesting testing and to keep them in care for at least one to three years. So that's what we'll track what you say. So the, uh, the evaluation plan will, will happen is that we'll actually be monitoring uh, the, this process monthly, ensure we don't uh, run into any snags uh, during the process just to make sure that everything is going to flow the way that we envision how BTN, uh, how the BTN project is going to go in Detroit. Um, and also gathering data to present to the Black Ace Institute and the Health Department uh, to, co uh, to coordinate uh, strategic planning with this process since we're a new, uh, since we're a new chapter. We'll also want to be able to respond to those those changes that are going to be needed really quick. So working with the health department is really going to help with that. We're right there in the middle of the planning process. Well, so <laughs> uh, speaking on the success and the challenges mm -hmm. of the fellowship, um, I actually this process actually 
gave me a lot more confidence. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. We bring you greetings from the New York and I am Carly Church. Knowledge around HIV. And we will continue today. Now, I can actually educate not only the community, but also other agencies around uh, <laughs> HIV itself and also <laughs> the health disparities <laughs> about how they're being addressed in the city. And also, I was platforms to educate other individuals. I didn't know anything about HIV. I had worked with the peer educators on my campus uh, pretty much. The so my first week, I will never forget, I just want to cry the entire week because they threw me in with the youth and adolescents. So just getting the feel of the job, seeing time management is going to be an issue. Years old, right? So learning how to juggle all these things is going to be an interesting thing. Positive. And from that week forward, I knew that this is my passion and my purpose and what I used to do. And it's like every time when I be trying to apply for a job, I'm like, okay, Lord, okay, I hear you. And then we let you know the state office to do the supportive services. So I didn't share how we will increase your increase the leadership within our networks and also to, um, some other women and now working with me as I have an experience of working with everyone. I am Lee Brown. Uh, so I work for the University of Arkansas. My name is Treat Strokes for patients throughout the state of Arkansas. Uh, and we are sick enough. My passion, however, is for HIV prevention and trust development. Uh, so in November of 2014, yes, we you said there were like four things, but nobody and our mission is pretty much to create create their same links to a greater quality of life. And uh, I was actually actually itself sits on the HIV and I think well, two thousand. Don't even know that's what it does. Uh, you have to be able to have to connect to the HIV because I'm close to uh, or even personal interaction. I had a family member that was diagnosed. And uh, so I feel that I want to, programs, you know, make that a career or do something to myself. Uh, keeping the competition, uh, competition. I want to be the person to make it for the uh, and other, unfortunately, uh, other parents. <laughs> <laughs> like that. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, work in the state of Texas. I don't get any knowledge exactly. And then in 2012, I started seeing all of my friends. That's what builds the barrier. And or something the extra for the other organizations, uh, other or, uh, individuals who are gaining access into these programs because they can't find out. So I thought that it was something that I needed to do immediately to change that. So I started working with a non profit organization, Living Effective Corporation, uh, and pretty much got much more than I learned about it now. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, with me, I find a unique aspect to mention or uh, to have you guys found like some champions in Arkansas because I approach it from a I'm a paramedic and I've been doing uh, public no, health since 2008. Um, and I'm just uh, going to expand that. I recently so had my bachelor's in the science, and so I've been trying to build a foundation on that. Uh, we had the opportunity, the opportunity to uh, enroll in the yes. AHU program, yeah. like I said, um, Trey Wayman Health Authority. That's a very important you help uh, peer training, things like that. To to that. that. Some, some of those people are interested in being part of the B10. The we're playing that your presentation. Uh, some of our, yeah. So, and so, our leadership is interested in being part of it, as well as when I mentioned our mission. Our population is 100,000, Georgia 97,000. We have access to We are primarily a metropolitan group. Now, that is the city of Little Rock. Most yeah, people wouldn't think of Little Rock uh, that make up our area or the metropolitan area. So when people see Little Rock, they think that it's all one area, but it's actually several different cities that make that up. And also when people think of Little Rock, they think of uh, the Hilton, 
when he became president put Little Rock on the map. And we actually were uh, brought up a little bit earlier, you know, back in the time during these vacations with the Central High School uh, episodes that happened to me. So I saw uh, several things um, that are unique about us, or not unique, but they are different, or are various for us. So we have a lot of different I know it's uh, in overall health, uh, which is actually a step up in the slide here to 40. I want to get to where you are in the right direction. I just want to stop that. Firstly, thank you. Formal statewide infrastructure that Bill Wilson is important for the needs of We focus on those that are students in poverty or that are adults or women. We don't do anything specific for college students. I'm just going to pose the my name is so, uh, as I say, these are some of our uh, economic barriers that we face in Arkansas. Or, um, statistics for us. Uh, uh, the main thing that uh, we wanted to focus on today is the name is Mark Idea. As you see, Arkansas runs for those who know me on more places. Right along with the uh, United States averages as far as for the for all time, the biggest. I guess what you see would be the distance that we get in the Arkansas is 39,000. That's exciting. Uh, and the United States is about 50,000. So, as far as HIV in Arkansas, uh, currently, well, this is from a summary. Um, and the end of 2012 was the latest number that have been released. And we have since received some local data that uh, have talked about home. People are 2014 is the latest that was released in certain uh, areas of the city. But we're going to get it out of the country. I have a couple numbers that we are eating. So in 2012, we had 5,000 diagnosed. Um, it's also a larger to most people. Uh, in 2013, we had new women. Uh, even heard of five medical people in two cases. Uh, in 2012, we have nine deaths. Um, one of the biggest things we want you to see is so, in 2012, the uh, 74% of the cases in men me were male to male contact, 9% for yeah. from addiction yeah. drugs, and so also to kind of our that, Arkansas, after completing my finance degree at Jackson State University, I decided to go to Alabama and attend graduate school at Everything is in one category, so we're working on actually trying to get that change so that we can get more service and more targeted information as they help educate. So, after about six months, I'm promoted to program coordinator. So, instead of it shows the number of persons living with HIV in 2012, and you know this, you'll see a lot of from dark red or red color along this border of the state. And it's primarily well, uh, with the Mississippi Delta. Uh, but before you think about the other, what is important not about that for us is that this is an area that's so, along the uh, uh, Mississippi River, which I reached. Which, um, I was placed with the opportunity to travel to the state of the Which is primarily slave here. Compared to the state of the most plantation. And we know about it. So we have to get it. But while over there, I also learned that the HIV is in the state of Arkansas. That's where they pretty much live. So, um, welcome to the as it relates to Atlanta, HIV, Georgia, uh, or yeah, HIV, you'll see that those were the no areas of the population. Uh, popular traits and things that were noted for, yeah, including the number of HIV cases, cases prevalent as well. Now, you will um, see the this area right here uh, is Pulaski County, which is where we are uh, located in the uh, It's the center of Arkansas, and this area is Jefferson County. And we also have a top of the four million. That's county. And as a race and ethnicity, we see that Caucasian and make up our city. is also one of their original populations. And this eastern area of the state, again, is primarily. Mississippi River um, or the border of the state, and it directly uh, correlates with the here simply show the breakdown of HIV infection by race. So, 
And well, this slide is, is um, this is our most current uh, state, cases in Atlanta uh, are in the of African treatment cascade for Arkansas. And if you notice, it only goes through the number uh, per 100,000. Right now, we do not have a treatment cascade for HIV from Georgia uh, in a state that is inclusive of all. Uh, our so, as we see, you know, in the previous slide, we noticed that after the market statement, that less than 35% of the total number of HIV cases in the state. And those are the only things that are related to services. So this is where we have one of the issues that we're going to focus on the rest of the All right. So, oh, I'm sorry. Let's Raise awareness around the state of AIDS. Uh, of our, the way our state is set up for our data. One of our modules is a little clever on the city's lines. It's not disseminated. AIDS and Black Americans, social determinants, perspectives. When we did this presentation, it allowed us the opportunity to look at the epidemiological data of that particular epidemic. So, this shows the HIV incidence in Arkansas in 2018. And I don't know if you can see the numbers, but it shows the orange that you see is African American. And, uh, and the own. particular population all over the world. So the HIV incidents in Arkansas to include black females, black women, black versus 52 of all other ethnicities. Uh, the prevalence is only roughly around the same 44%. Black or African American, and 56% other. To just, uh, um, below then you, you see I what it becomes an issue in the total population of Arkansas. Because I feel there, in a lot of cases, 15 people don't talk about HIV. Of the total population, because of state yeah, they account for 44 and 48% of, of the HIV incidents. So purpose. instead of just basing it all off of my own personal thoughts, I decided to bring the community in to see how they feel. Black women, and we had a very, very diverse group of individuals. We had age groups from maybe early 20s to late 60s, early 70s. We had African American heterosexual men, African American men, sleep with men, heterosexual women. We had church populations represented, college representation. So we had a very robust um, community discussion around this topic, and we were able to, as a community, Kind of come up with different barriers that uh, people face. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we might go into a little bit about um, as well as the tools and tips that people could use to, you know, create a well, space where they feel comfortable. As working in a community based organization, you pretty much connect so, um, out of those to a lot of different organizations because we're seeing our reach test. Uh, we did give so we already and at least 95 percent of our so participants. So everybody was ready to jump on board. board. Leonid is a part of the Arkansas Planning Board, so they will have a lot of members that want to kind of generate from that. They're excited and ready to go um, Okay, we have another video here uh, showing the networking within our organization. It's an infection by transmission category. And recruiting those members from different outreach tests. The category of my business are outlines and blue. Educators on board. Through the MSL. They group that I was talking about as part of the college camp. Those individuals are the eyes and ears of the college camp. Which is way greater than all the other categories. They are the ones that know what's going on. And they're the ones that know what's going on. They're peers. And they're the ones that know what's going on. So or a heterosexual contact. And come in and treat for them. women, the majority of the cases were made up from heterosexual contact. And expecting the unexpected, of course, you know, it's starting new things. So, so it's seeing that, that black women's inner were so great. I was around the bush. I decided to go a little more. <laughs> 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 so somebody. <laughs> so to get out of here in Ahu so I feel as if that's a population that we're going to So I decided to present a module at one of our local conferences um, on the medical and social challenges of aging with HIV. And to be more inclusive, <laughs> we looked at it from two perspectives. One perspective being people over 50 years old. And one perspective with people living with the virus for a so, um, long period of time, um, partners, 10 years plus. Um, um, one of the things we're doing is reaching out to traditional black institutions or that institutions that are a robust conversation as well. Uh, we were able to discuss some so the lip intergenerational lip differences that we saw lip as far as the perceptions of what AIDS and what HIV is. But you'll also see. Uh, uh, 
my organization went for like the sense of mentorship because we had people that had to live in HIV. And then you'll see and they this, have people that uh, are some other institutions such as Andrew Smith College. I'm to feel encouraged that I'm going to be able to take care of it. Those are all three HBCUs that reside in the world. Uh, we have so four total to, uh, uh, that exchange with I felt was the most impactful uh, part of the that, that this um, presentation my because we were focused on Little Rock, but they are part of our opinion. Uh, is addressing that as well as other colleagues. Uh, uh, we also have the Arkansas Department of Health, the Life Clinic, and the University of Arkansas Center for Medical Sciences, the Public Health Department, and their College of Family, excuse me, Department of Health. One of the main reasons why I really wanted to push the information uh, about so the program is recently I went to speak at the University of Arkansas. It was about 140 students, and I stood before them and I simply asked, Hey, so have a have heard of the So we're looking for agency. No one in the class had no housing. Not one person in the class. Job ready to make skills, you know. All of those type and of things. We're also going to reach out to you because the it's college age. Department of Family. We expect and for our medicine. Uh, you know, uh, they will to be increased. The red or their things. research division. We'll be assisting us in collaborating or developing our project. So the straight A student, the graduate, but from the when I graduated, I still didn't so, know about uh, the world. Doing the work. About uh, so I we plan on doing outreach, uh, testing, and education, focusing on to learn biomedical things that they want to do. With the national strategy so we of the so that Just because people are in college or educated, that they know these things, be because in a lot of cases, they don't. So, and that being trained, so I wanted to do it in the training of the world. But not only give information about what PrEP is, but also information on how to access PrEP, how to pay for PrEP, how to sustain the PrEP prescription. So uh, with the help of Ed Duda, we about 24 individuals came out, but the group was intimate enough so people's questions could really get answered. People were really intrigued to know what it is about Positive people in the reason why I felt that was important because even if I'm listening with HIV, PrEP could benefit potentially my partner. We could I start a snowball effect of continuous learning, or I may just tell a friend, or I may just tell a family member. But after a while, we start to generate buzz around. My story, where we have a family with five consumers. They came in and they shared their story. I also so now I will take a moment to go into my own and proposed she to be transformative. So uh, she shares some an idea that I have how she is um, very effective in a black community, especially in the South. She uh, faced so we'll, me um, um, in school with her teeth, 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 and she shared that about being HIV positive, and then from there, oh, the whole the class, parents want to come up and have their child. Increase proactivity so for sexual health and raise opportunities around the state of HIV and AIDS in Atlanta, Georgia, to groups of black college students and identified parents that can carry HIV in their child. Um, three of the major colleges that I want to work with. With um, include Morehouse College, so, uh, uh, University, you, and Market. You can think about our beach and although we're not, why we I target those um, organizations specifically for because they are located in one of the highest uh, prevalent zip codes in Atlanta. And, with and, with the University of and my we're organization that I work for, NASA, uh, 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 we're also located as well as in that same zip code. So I feel why not just start to work in my own backyard? And then if it's something that's successful, we can implement it. Uh, with the university to do to uh, HBC, it's going to be a really one to put these on our or features or additional black HBC, which is interesting. The uh, okay, a little data that kind of is on the prevalence of HIV and STD approach. So it's all here on the right, and college student, well, black college student. So. One of our problems that, that we realize that uh, health and human services have not been getting the case of our health and vulnerable our families to win. And new HSP diagnosis. Or in vulnerable populations such as in Atlanta in 2013, about 80. And what this is, leads to a fragmented system of care. And 
And so um, the goal of our project uh, so is to have a lead tech somewhere between here and here. There's some of in our future. Part so, so and what uh, and we are working, working towards is to increase the workforce of BTC to be certified in this area and women to educate African American how We're going to increase the knowledge of HIV and SCD health literacy.
and why does teach people how to educate as we do more education? What we found out is really good for the two or two. Um, and um, and reduce the stigma. And Bobby or Duke Dixon that we need to to get more information out there. Yeah, yeah. 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 We will do our introduction. We will also have additional surveys to work on basic science, which is teaching. Also, take a look at what I'm doing and the national strategy. Discuss some surveys on the health care or the health care to see what we can do to improve, what you know, where we did wrong, or you know. Try to identify areas of improvement or uh, to make the next session better. And we will keep real time. We'll really, really get into the with this and we will update it and start to paint the picture of what's on. really going on behind the scenes. All right, so um, success is like all of the basic science discoveries as far as having information about how far or close we are to vaccination or injectable or treatment. We want to also provide a from the 30 day boot camp. I actually work in a clinical like, setting. Um, the presentation that Dr. Claus gave for that because even though we went through 30 days of truth camps, there was still more than we shot. So I want to be able to take that, that most recent information. So I also work with our ID doctor, Dr. Kim. Discuss the reproductive rate, which simply is an equation that shows certain factors increasing the likelihood of transmission of viruses, STDs. And build some uh, relationship. Uh, biomedical provision, so we can educate people about that. Uh, for me, that was a good time. So, if there are colleges that I can go to, to make sure that it doesn't happen. As a uh, um, emergency department position, I didn't uh, focus on the pivotal module, helping me understand and what's going so on. When you branch it into this area, uh, or at least attend it, that's all. So, the third and final module would at our um, state and local levels uh, in our in, in our city. Uh, um, HIV in America, I women in Germany, HIV in uh, Black MS, partner notification, zero talks at module. I learned a lot from each one of each person has a diverse. So, we can discuss um, potential. Well, I learned. Things like Tuskegee that happened in the past that kind of contributed to the environment. I think I'll take a statement for stories or each person and modify that to change my practice or to um, in between the go advance. I would like to also to the three basic learning modules, modules, which could be completed uh, in webinars or brief on-campus presentations, and one service project. Um, this the learning module one would be moving people for in me, a working mind. the challenges was I think I that the delay in mobilization and people are with your goals and the things that I know that I treat people the same way I want them to treat me. So I know we all have experience, but we email and we respond to the Three weeks, the female. Third, talk to talk, third division. But I was still real, but it was a major challenge because sometimes we had some real stuff going on that we didn't. So as acquiring sponsorships to. So that was one of the major. And then it makes me a lot of it would be a stuff out there. Kind of watching. There's no way I can say anything or you know. Am I really valued in this fellowship? You know, and so. My goal my so it then it makes you feel like, okay, so, you know, they don't care about that, I don't care. And recruit the most motivated to be tested over a certain amount of time. And then we, you know, encourage each other to go on. So we end up having to reward the other organization. What chapter of scholarship will find in the office to assist with their activity? Evaluation of this program includes a lot. So, but it was uh, more of a personal thing. So, so uh, I, um, just to get a baseline of this, uh, of what people are in. So, uh, not only do I want to know what they know, but I want to also assess where people are from and so what people are to see plays a role in the things that people know. Just support myself while I was here as well. Uh, 
Uh, and the Queen Ma just was the test and the way it was. Yeah, that was a challenge. I lost one of the ways I'm going to try to throw it in. But we're going to be able to do the same thing to make sure that everybody's here. Qualitative mistake. As far as the detail level or a program or training. The, not to so get numbers, but to really dig deep, deep into the reason, reason why people believe in the nation that they uh, we face challenges not just for our safety, but the way that what we things in the past contribute to our nation and what things in the past contribute to your perception of what they say is like. So I really want to dig into the nation and then we were told, oh, you can't take things to the way people were raised. So we put out money and did all these things to have these information because I guess they were concerned with the uh, appearance that we have. And you know, growing up in the city, a lot of people have been saying information that we pretend. So and uh, so that's why we were not able to show more specific print posts. Are able to develop uh, college students, which is what we originally had. I would love to see our part. And also something So that was one of the areas to not only. Ascertain <laughs> stigma from um, um, internal as as, um, a viewpoint, but also stigma around clinics, stigma around people living with HIV, stigma around getting tested for STDs. So I would like to touch a lot of areas of stigma because I so, think stigma um, is one of the things that we are planning to do, whether we are funded or not. And until we start to talk about it and address it, we're just going to keep perpetuating it. We will find a way to say, hey, what's going on? If we get this funded now, we'll get it funded in the future because we'll have the data to support it. Right now, we don't have any say why data or any data that we can use as a basis for our. Definitely uh, progressive. Initiative. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so we've seen just us increasing um, uh, our uh, sample. Really with increase the, the uh, of details. As far as recommendations, uh, I don't know if that's for the great program or but, 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 but uh, more things I think that if we had some time more for the BAI, it was an online so, uh, 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 work with our parents and coaches and webinar or something that can be engaged throughout the time so that I wouldn't have to take this much time away from home. Create some collaborative projects that we can work on and also get by here in other um, The uh, community, because you'll be able to have more people there that will are be willing to be involved in the community before they may not be able to leave. There, there are a lot of different just different different facilities in general. Uh, there are a lot of non traditional organizations in um, um, Atlanta that I would and love to engage and see how interested they would be. Just you know, collaborate with us. To increase the membership. There are so many things to work with. But I would be so much more impactful if you find a means of collaboration. A lot of times we have so many collaborations, you know, objectives. But we get caught in a race of numbers. You know, fight for fight. Sometimes it makes it hard to actually focus on the work. We're so if there's a way we can all meet under one roof and kind of have a more structured and coordinated response to HIV. I think that it'll be more normalized testing for STDs on college campuses. I think that it'll be more acceptable. These are a list of just potential partners. The list doesn't stop here. I think most of the also have a ripple effect with the we will start to some. I don't think they're being community members want to be a part of being involved. Uh, we'll increase so our I want to uh, work with, with the community. I want to be the people who participate with, 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 with um, your black owned businesses. I want to work with the company. But I'm here to solicit some potential partners that could be ready to say this. Um, that's the information that I have to read. Uh, what questions do you have at this time? <laughs> <laughs> so you talked about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's already moved. What else do you want to do? Okay. <laughs> well, 
definitely just raising awareness up for on college campuses as it pertains to just getting information, getting literature, working with the schools where we can get in the health clinics and get pictures and posters and really just generate buzz around it. Because I think first, in order for people to be comfortable with you utilizing the service, they have to, one, know what it is and not feel like it's something that's going to make them sick in the long run. People have questions and side effects. But not only do we want to put people on prep, but we want to educate them around the importance of adherence and to continuously use condoms. And the whole process that you're going to have to get screened continuously. So um, just streamlining the messaging to the point where we're not just giving people the tool, but we're really giving them the information that they need to successfully do a prep treatment. Okay. Um, let me dig just a little bit deeper. Okay. Um, so what I mean by medical prevention, so great prep. So I think that especially with you being in Atlanta, we have two clinical trials that are in Atlanta, um, Amsterdam, we have two. So what I mean by that, so we understand that prep is only one tool. Right. And so when we think about biomedical interventions, how are we going to, um, number one, educate people around prep, but two, then look at other biomedical interventions such as my side. So is that part of the focus or is it just Right now, my primary focus is prep, but I do see it important. I do see that it's important to push other biomedical um, advancements because prep is only one option. But um, I'm happy that you did state like microbicides and like just being more comfortable with participating in research, so we can get even more technological advancements in the future. Perfect. My second question. Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> um, so when you went to your goals and objectives, which I thought with um, and maybe it's more of a, a, a common question. So I see your module is to incorporate Anaheim. Uh, part, of the, part of what Anaheim looks at is that whole health component. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't see in your goals and objectives was one, that rapid re entry into, uh, into care. So that 30 days um, now. But then also, I would, I would caution that with those goals of trying to find who that newly diagnosed or as an age diagnosis, is incorporate some type of uh, wellness component to it. So I didn't see anything around counseling, case management, and substance use services. And so I think that when you want to um, engage clients, that that needs to be in the home. So I would encourage you to add those as goals to your um, to your goals. I think they're really good. I think that would come up. Direct to by the way. Thank you for being here, Oh, were there any other questions, comments? Anything? Questions, comments. I think you did a very good job. Thank you. Very proud of you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for doing something with the man over 50. As a reference, today, Tabby, with this fancy. Um, when you were working on your projects, um, did, did you take any look at your needs assessment and how does your needs, needs assessment fit into your projects or your, your proposed projects? Uh, the needs assessment contributed to my selection of my target population because when I noted that the the most cases were in that particular zip code where those colleges were located, I figured that that was an immediate call to action. Because a lot of times we can focus our efforts everywhere else, but we don't. So in order to be proximate, I use the epidemiological data to trace the virus to that particular zip code. And then I also looked at the amount of cases that were taking place in that age bracket and noted them as college age students. So I decided to use that to direct my focus towards that particular. Yes, sir. Um, did you have any challenges for <laughs> um, I think we all can um, agree that we had small challenges. Um, it was two of us at first, and um, we had a lot of plans to do a lot of things together. But um, you know, my other cohort was granted the opportunity to leave, so it was kind of like starting from like scratch all over. And at first, I was overwhelmed. I'm like, okay, I gotta do 
this 20 page paper by myself, I did this 45 minute presentation. Where's Charles? <laughs> but, um, <laughs> I mean, from a distance, even if it was just saying, okay, they just calm down. Have you started on it? Have you been working on it? But as that transition, and we kind of ironed everything out. Zena was very pivotal in making sure that, you know, I was had everything that I needed, or that, you know, me and Charles knew exactly what was expected of us after we separated. But um, other than that, it was a breeze. Like, 30 days was cool. Um, training two was interesting. Training three was dynamic, and now we're here. So um, my challenge is just being persistent with the pro trust in the process. Mm -hmm. Trust in the process. <sighs> yes, ma'am. So good job, Zay. I'm really proud of you. you. Did an awesome job. Um, I think you really. Um, because you had some new growth throughout um, Ahu, and I think you we do have a lot of stars in Ahu, but I definitely think you are one of the stars in Ahu. So, thanks for your dedication and your hard work. It's very noticed, like just from everything that you've done. Uh, so, my question is a bit like uh, kind of unrelated. Okay. It's related, but you know, finance uh, background, right? Uh, and you're kind of doing HIV work. So, is there have you thought of like how to bridge those two, or is that something that you've been about or um, you know it's on your mind mm, I have always thought about a way to make the two connect sure. and um, I think just being financially sound makes you a better public administrator in, in a sense of you know how to work the budget you know how to plan you know what you need and you may also know how to get the money so um, you know years down the line when I'm running my own organization and stuff like that, I have a basic underlying knowledge of finance, but I hated business. I went to finance because I thought I was going to get a job when I graduated, and I didn't. So I was like, uh. <laughs> but yes, uh, hopefully one day it all just goes together. We can make some magic somehow. Is that just that you use the word, the verbiage uh, of phrase consciousness, and that was something in. Third training that we went over in terms of just uh, being aware of the first consciousness, we're being very cognizant of that and choosing the perfect for that. Thanks to Miss Coleman, I'm very cognizant of that because it's a distinct <laughs> difference. So I want to make people aware, but I want to impact your everyday way of living, you know, not just having knowledge, but just the whole way you. For the whole way you just process the whole everything, I just want to raise the country. Because we are aware. A lot of times we are aware. Even when we look at the data, it's not that we have riskier sex. It's not that we don't know. It's just we're impacted in a different way. We need to know. Not that HIV is, you know, infecting people. We know that. We've been hearing that for years. And that's why. And that is going to require uh, an elevation of consciousness. I know this is Initially, I plan on relying on you guys. <laughs> we all stay close enough. You know, the South, we have a problem. And just because I'm in Georgia does not mean I'm not passionate about Mississippi. Does not mean I'm not passionate about Alabama because I've lived in those places. Like, even when I did my presentation with HIV over 50, it was, the argument came up that, oh, you young whippersnappers don't know anything about HIV because you didn't see when people were dying. And I'm like, you could be from a small town where people are still dying because they're not at to care. Or because there's only one clinic and you don't want anybody to see you going in there, so you're not going to go. Or you don't want to take your meds because you don't want your mom to find out that you have HIV or your brother. So people are still dying. So like, if I'm doing amazing things in Georgia, but my brothers and sisters in Mississippi and Alabama are still dying, then I'm still not doing my job. 
So we built these connections for a reason. We have to create a network where I can call Justin and say, hey, Justin, I need a speaker for this panel. I got you some coin. I'm going to fly you out and get your cute little honorarium. But, you know, we have to rely on each other because, like you say, a lot of people don't know the things that we know. Yeah, I want to train other trainers. And my whole goal of working with the HBCU um, group organization is once we build the leaders, because I want to take like two or three from every organization and let them take the information back to their chapters. Let the chapter take it back to the campus, you know, and just start to spread the information out all like that. But I definitely want to train peer leaders and other people so they can have the same knowledge base that we have. Hmm? Okay, so um, I was wondering, um, <laughs> but if I love your idea and um, knowing the lifestyle, like we know it and stuff. I was wondering why you didn't think to um, channel some of the underground organizations as well. I think that's a, a dynamic idea. It's just with the the level of discretion, you know, I wouldn't want to expose people because of the negative connotation that uh, underground Greek organizations have. And for those who may not know what underground Greek organizations are, it is when you have male members of sorority, such as AKA or Delta Zeta, and you have male or female members of fraternities. But it's done kind of like the house and ball scene where it's done in the club, you know, they stroll. But it's deeper than that. They have chapter meetings and they have full structures. They have national conferences. But when you're working with those populations, you're outing them. And with that not being socially okay or acceptable, I would never want to jeopardize that for someone. But I still would want to get them the information so they can, once they're all private, you know, the most underground organizations have to build their own mm -hmm. organization now, so they're kind of straying away from what we call the mother, kind of like the most narrow organization. So I think there's a kind of a great alley, which we may have to do. Thank you. 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 Of the, uh, so that's who I spoke with the majority of the slides. But 
Poor man, we're driving. We'll do the best we can. This slide comes from our um, health needs assessment. And I'm not going to read the whole thing back here. I just want to point out the, um, the number of African Americans in the city. Black women's health. That number is actually changed the data from 2010. And our numbers are really going public. I was very motivated and passionate um, about really the other thing I want addressing to, to you all to keep that in mind as we go through this presentation. A community -based I want you to take a vision in in that I keep that picture in mind of what um, DC looks I like. I want you to wait for that. Think and about DC and think through. about the different board because you can see the next board the next board. In later slides, I want you to keep in mind which boards. There are. Okay, this is one, this two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So keep that in mind. The other thing I want to point out on this slide is that African Americans are the largest racial groups and represent a majority of the population. And so I loved working with this group of people. And we're going to talk about the other thing I want to point out on this slide is that African Americans are the largest racial groups and represent a majority of the population. And so I loved working with this group of people. And we're going to talk about the other thing I want to point out on this slide is that African Americans are the largest racial groups and represent a majority of the population. And so I loved working with this Okay, so this slide talks about them discussing, um, participating with um, them, um, conducting focus groups. So although I am going to refer to the need to be in the I've been doing as the scribes and the focus groups, I've been doing a lot of intimate. So work with myself, so I think intimately connected with what their needs are. Um, so we have a slightly um, higher median really household many income people, than I the rest of the country. Employ the name but the rate is still really high. If you look at that, that number. Number. Um, so you know one of the things I want to point out is when I look at where those activists are, um, you can again. Um, uh, uh, I saw well, that looking at as a way to return to the source of my history and culture, but, I told you, but at the same time, time okay. continue to advance. And a key thing I want you to know here, health disparities freedom. will always exist throughout the world. Um, and those that I saw that my mother and grandmother right. and aunts and given, all right. of those women who um, have fought now, for social justice. Um, Look at that, that rich legacy, and so I'm and here to continue what we talked about earlier. Legacy. And, and so, as I find myself in the public health arena, I'm sorry, I'm having a show with you. So, anyway, to expand um, as much needed, and um, I believe wholeheartedly um, that HIV is a social justice issue, and that has a result that I can continue the legacy within that HIV. Total population of DC is about 700,000, a little less. Um, so, from that, just office, a little bit of background uh, history on uh, Dallas. 15, it's located in North Central Texas. Um, and living in HIV, urban city. Or AIDS, and this is from 2012. That's about 3% of the population. We all know um, the World Health Organization. It's five million nine hundred fifty-four thousand, one percent of the population, and it's growing. And so we are at almost three percent. So that's so, so it, that's it's really large. Uh, we'll that's talk a little bit later about some of the things, some of the positive yeah. aspects of I mean, what's, what's happening in the city and some of the communications are some of that. Um, so I want to go ahead. Um, I'm not if you look at the population in Dallas, um, according to the 2014 uh, estimate, a million people have a position in Dallas now. They account for the million or 26 million in Texas. So people living with HIV. African Americans make up roughly. I this slide before, but it's still kind of a million. Caucasians make up 34 percent. You know, when I look at that number. Uh, now this is a slide that I really wanted to spend some time with because I if like you look I at like the that you see per capita income the blue line is at the African Texas American versus twenty eight thousand. And as you can see, uh, we've actually had some progress. The medium family income to is forty eight thousand in the right direction in Texas and sixty four thousand. So much higher. Fourteen percent of the residents in Dallas live um, below the federal poverty line. It's about twenty-five percent. I just put this slide here. And in South Dallas, we that's in the um, The rate of black males 
living with an HIV diagnosis is 2.8 times higher than that of white males. A little bit about um, education, because um, I think that, that, that is another thing. aspect that really it impacts is public health. health. Uh, the two, said Education Weekly of 2015 ranked Texas as the and gave it a C minus. Um, um, and, and the rules also have a national for the as well. And their rates are also not high, not as high as ours, but again, based on the numbers of the population, they make about, they're about 9%. And if we turn our attention to the state of the population, we also in particular and look at the demographic profile. We will so see that in the side by side comparison, uh, to the 2012, and the uh, number of people living in the HIV, there were approximately 2.4 million people in Dallas. Yeah. If you look at, if you expand like, them out to Dallas, um, that kind of create the emerging thing. metropolitan area, They're that really goes up to. Four million. Points. So when we start looking at and so the EMA, the people who um, are living in poverty also and include the populations a little bit north of the Dallas 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 area. Um, <laughs> again, look at those words. What's important to note about this is that um, the deaths due to HIV, uh, the mortality between again, uh, not only are we just over twenty, but we are also. And then um, and within two years, 2010 and 2012. So we tend so to survive to less population. than our white counterparts who have similar the similar conditions. So of the district res residents who died from HIV, approximately if you look at the race and the African the life, if you look at the total um, breakdown in Dallas, down by race, ninety seven that is um, seven percent. And this is according to the emerging metropolitan area. This is also taken up. Yeah, so it may vary from. And that tells you that we have a lot of work left to do in these assessments. Even though we're making some progress, and I'm happy to see it, there's still a tremendous amount of work. Uh, HIV service. So, areas. looking at some of the data from the DC needs assessment, again, we talk about that 3% of patient residents have been diagnosed with HIV and that it's an epidemic. Um, our highest chip population is a, a black men in the age range of 40 to 49. Um, and here like, you can see again the purpose yeah, for the income in Dallas County. The one of the data was the balance and the four hundred and seventy six. The rates of black women were also increasing in DC. And that was something they were finding alarming. So even though our numbers were starting to go down, they're starting to see some rises in, in the black community. They're trying to figure out why. Um, AIDS is the seventh leading cause of death here again. It shows in Dallas County. That but, um, what I found interesting here was it's number oh. seven. Number eight is homicides. So, and we hear about all the homicides in DC. All the news, all the time. You know, there are more people down some of the counties that are north. You will see um, like Collin. So, County, homicides are down in Dallas County. Yeah, and so that's Dallas, so the 
in terms um, of HIV. Increased housing services. Uh, this um, is something that they've been trying to do. Harris County, which is still an issue. Um, I think we have this in a lot of cities so where people are trying to uh, uh, that time it was a cumulative total. Also going to be just uh, 16,146. Um, and and there's something you said about just school to care and remember to routinely check. And I think this number here as a way of understanding like where, where they are in the well. country. So uh, this is another take. I want to include this slide because this, this talks about healthcare right. facilities in DC. So again, right. I go back to looking at those those wards or those areas of the city where there's high African American. So uh, I just took the look at the, the, the areas of the county. city where the people are the poorest. Um, there are high the number of new Americans and high concentrations of HIV. These wars also have struggles in the least in some populations. Start looking at the hospital uh, and the American say that forty seven percent of all they don't have the services as some of the forty parts of the city four percent with HIV. So forty seven percent incidence and forty four percent. So now I'm moving into the to talk about B ten. I feel like and all this information about the data is that between 2008, from 2008 to 2011, 33 percent. Now we accept everybody to be in DC should be clamoring to be a part of B10 because the need is so severe. Um, so here, B10, um, to give you a little bit of history, uh, B10 was started in 2013. I actually trained in other large urban cities. Um, and that's how I actually found out about the new diagnosis were in place. And we had a small group, uh, there weren't that many of us, that, um, but we lost our leadership you know, and that kind of being impacted disbanded a bit. So I've been trying to really work to try to bring and again, some of the things that are in the South Dallas earlier. I did want to put this one out of the CGI. And um, they got some of the things that have that degree of, of the population to show that South Dallas right now is in terms of the number of people living with and getting people interested and engaged in B10. And I've had some started to see some of the income for South Dallas is making me happy. So, um, <laughs> the B10, rate of 13 point I think the, saw the key thing to me about B10 is that earlier. they want to provide a train of the federal property in the pipeline that is 25%. Of the this one sticks out to me because I work for the uh, ADA trials, and I know that we have not graduated from the trials in African Americans, and it's always and in Dallas, like the county in 2009. So, to more people that we can get educated about the trials and get them to the rest of the engagement in that process. When I think that they're awful. And we will learn this about the why some of these other things are very You know, because some of the health disparities, like you said, it's not because we're not trying to do prevention, it's not because we have riskier sex. There's something else going on that we really need to um, identify. In terms of my target population for the. Um, and um, facilitate expanded black participants in clinical trials, living with HIV, uh, appropriate treatment, and improve adherence in black communities. And some information um, in terms of all of these the things are met through the different, different women in the four different project areas of B10 advocacy treatment. There were 3,109 women. In I, mean, I had I'll talk a little bit later about the B10 interest meeting that I had and I did it for this model and talked about the new treatment area and everybody was interested. They already know it's kind of interesting. They're already trying to start different. They want to have women made up. They want to have a group of or just women in general. Social media groups in this particular case made up nineteen percent of all new HIV prevalence as well. So this talks a little bit about. Uh, me trying to percent in DC. So really, you know, I, again, I was trying to count for seventy percent of women in the thing with HIV. So that's over. Anywhere in the United States, um, with Rebecca's um, help, and her, a lot of people have moved on and not in the same place anymore. But I think get one so of those people who are interested in participating in uh, B10 as we kind of uh, realign ourselves. Um, and refocus. Um, yeah. One of the things I really want to see was get involved in some of the existing. Progress to an eight diagnosis within 
one of the benefits of being in Washington, D.C. is we do have a lot of people. Looking at the 2013 but it also makes it challenging because I started meeting with some of these people. The over 600 people that were surveyed. Yeah, it's a great picture starting this group. But the American Women Survey were out of here. We are already involved in five different groups. I really don't think I want to go to another meeting. You know, I'm just you know, at that. So, um, so yeah. most of the older advocates, they've been around for a while, to so the really engage with them, and they all be tied to the reason. So, that what I found interesting was when I did the, the BTAC interest meeting, um, who came, the people that came out were actually younger people. One Which third good, you know, I was excited to see that. So, diet so the younger people, the they, they're more interested than the older people. That's about 600 from the new assessment. And then 5% so of African Americans who are long term survivors. Um, engaging with DC Care, we're going to have partnering with the DC Public Work, Us Helping Us, um, the Women's Collective. Um, and so, what are the prevention, prevention needs? They have uh, just agreed to allow us to use their. Um, and most of us are not surprised to know that the problems that I was trying to go to economic issues. You know, so all that was saying that they came to the chapter of my work. Science and, and so and the education, education you know, trying to train the number one, and this is even when the folks are treated to the rest of the And so that is a real um, issue. How? Anyone who's um, doing any type of interview. Some of these groups I've partnered with and already we were working on two different projects together. And, and I saw that a little bit later on. But I recently, within the last week, um, unable to afford co uh, parents from Howard University. They're interested in having to come out to do their uh, the treatment, the medication, not feeling ill enough this time when I took a table with the hospital. They also um, will put the opportunity to put together a uh, faith workshop. So they also listed uh, medical case management, um, nutritional, sexual, emergency, long term mental. So and that's kind of the time that so they're, we're, we're really working to try to make sure OBG Excuse me, and along with that, I did my HIV education, my training, that I talked a little bit about having a hard time getting referrals for mammograms and informational materials. I did a little VTAM flyer, I did information sheets that had some materials to share with people who were interested You know, this was a very... And this talks a little bit about the interest meeting and what we did because about when we talked about women and Erica was really helpful and what are some of to pull that off. That you know, that you know, looking at just an eight to find a webinar and you're not getting those screens. Give an overview of what we have to do and about VTAN. And we from that we start right. to establish so the VTAN. We don't have a established chapter in Dallas. And so I'm. I have the pleasure um, of training activities uh, again because I'm still kind of getting stuff and together, and I don't have any help. I have to do some here. I did a three-day right. training, and that ended up being a really good fellows. Awesome. And we had other fellows in the area. They had a good group of people We're also there. Um, excited about it. I just I like presented on one part, and they were yeah. really gracious to have you to let me and they were three. Um, but it was also for fellows with some other people in the Dallas area, and so I think. A lot of the people who to, were at that you know, training pursue. came to the building the chapter and then building one you know, that all is about on the um, And so I've done some additional meetings. I've uh, had an opportunity and to do so the missions with age ready. I just had the objective this post. But he agrees with the national network policy brown bag. A highly trained black treatment advocate and to serve the strategic leaders and opinion leaders in their community. I decided to help them to train African American Increase early utilization of the so now we're moving on into the project phase and what I'm doing and I'm actually like to talk about the problem statement. I'm going to come back to this slide later because it is a little bit busy. And of the um, focus so the problem statement that the thing that I will focus on the point to be the treatment education. But I wholeheartedly believe that in the treatment education that we can really focus on at that time. Um, it was a very interesting project. I know that, but I have that it has potential, and I would love to see it move beyond. Um, we're going to be able to go to their doctors and have, and have the so efficacy. So the problem statement is trying to the transition plans and to talk to the doctors and not are disproportionately high in African-Americans in the district. And individuals who are retaining care have better outcomes, reduced chance of transmission. So providing the treatment management tools, stigma, 
I don't want to closure because the more that you approach it, you to better HIV management and people are more inclined to. So that's what we're trying to do. Disclose because one of the things that openly. You know, and I, I, of course, I made it is that, that whole treatment advocate for treatment, to advocate for more research, but I know it's very much care, true. and then you start to lose them. And so, how can we make that? How can we make that whole process? Yeah, yeah. What can we do? A little visual to make thing that people treat more safe. Our diet does, and in limited care, what can we do to make help them stay in care? And, and there's so some it. critical that we're missing there. So, how can we make that easier? So the project that I did, I came up with is to develop a treatment management app that will help people who are living with HIV better in the HIV support system. Black women that education. HIV positive African Americans recently connected to people. And so the study goals are to increase the literacy of HIV science and treatment among. We already have a history of um, HIV by you know, And so we want to see if this can help to engage um, those people. And that can give us some critical information. Make sure that um, the goal is um, to them. help retain people in care, reduce progression, and lower transmission. We're going to go back to the previous slide now that I've kind of explained a little bit and talk about to some power at least 10% of the women participants who are not. There's a way the actors are going to. Or to decrease the viral to have this to achieve viral suppression in one year. In other words, if we participate in the treatment app development is the huge one year. Do anything that don't have to happen. Ten percent of the women would either achieve development and then to test the app. So that's really what this whole thing is talking about. And again, like these are things that I have some short because we've already been doing them in the past. I assisted other fellows. This and done, this we will be able I've to see seen that, that, that as a matter of fact, like this could help two couple weeks problem. ago at the Grace Project, so which is a conference that brings so over 250 positive women to the market um, to Dallas so, um, to um, a hotel um, over the weekend to uh, but I think that to our population can support one another. Uh, I think find some I have women, I always have women coming up to me, even some that I may not remember, um, and they would say, no. This talks about, uh, obviously, we don't know to me at the conference. What are you doing? Okay, well, you know me from the study. 80% of cell phone users receive text messages. 50% of cell phone users receive emails. This is important data for me to Part of the app that I'm trying to continue to do because you know uses that I've these types of features to send alerts to how to sit and talk so, to my doctor. Uh, and because of it, I found that I've been this uh, ace.gov uh, uh, is that the more I have to learn, the more they are, they're white. So when you get that type of feedback, okay. I mean, it's just and minority cell phone owners is take advantage of a greater range so of while we have the anecdotal. Their white counterpart. I would so like to me, this said this is actually something that might be beneficial if we can find the right tool, if we can design the right type of the third goal. Goal. An objective is to improve um, their. Uh, so, and then other people have data plans, three self confidence, actually have ethics, used their phones to develop health information. Decreased disparity in science treatment. So, this is some additional evidence for that. So, the negative health outcomes and the side of the impact related that have already been used and the areas in which they've been used. I know some, this smaller part is hard to read. Um, and so, there, have been some, there has been some evidence that testing with an HIV adherence, science um, and treatment education, and treatment specific outreach uh, like that, that have developed for conferences, have had some degree of success. So there's some yeah. evidence that this might also be also what we've been doing so this is in Dallas with the women already. The, 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 the so we would look at the life cycle, the life cycle go it's into the app, antidepressant it's just the therapy um, and the different drugs. We have to develop the app, but then I want to talk about, about opportunistic infections and ACE-defining illnesses. And again, we want to be specific to women because you know, at one point in time, the um, cancer was not an ace of any illness. Women had to advocate and to threaten legal action in order to so get cervical you cancer. You hear a bit about the action uh, by the shock. And so, I think it separates it from to be aware of that. Everything that women 
HIV apps, you know, is that it has some specific to features and that I think are going to be beneficial for us. Um, there's no the HIV apps out there now. Um, there is some that are not identified, but we need to assess this feature where you can do a notification to individuals that you identify as understanding labs. I use the term survival partners, but that's important because oftentimes we tell them the pilot that I'm suggesting would be like your case manager, it could be your physician, and we also recommend like a one person to maximize So you would have either your case manager and or physician, you know, or a friend writing down your symptoms so that you can people that would get alerts to those of your medication and the ability and the confidence to sit down and to um, discuss the lab, then that would be so intimidating or not to so understanding what the doctor would talk to them and just take around to the physician about the best way to run that. And figure out what that is and which medications. So it's not just a medication tracker, appointment tracker. But you would get signals when, and those that's people one are institution that we went to, I'll just tell you a quick story that. that the Chinese are so excited about the information they would go right back to the medical director, director the and the doctor would call you and say, you know, you know, I don't take none of the things, I'm everything, and I can set up your system. So I need to go in there to administer because they were in a residential treatment center. And I, you know, it's every day, you know, this time, you survive that you can be met because you want to. So the medical Not director just, came in and sat in her. The survival partners that the individual has, has chosen, but other people who are using the app have become a network of that, 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 that we must be doing something right if we want to sit in the process. And and we're we're getting some information. In addition to the adherence factors, the five to four of our research that some other apps already have. We need more and we need more apps. So this is kind of my little fix. You know, I think that again, what life could look like the uh, goal would be tan, but it's been iterated in BTAN that yeah. you enter your data, when you enter your data, they contact and determine whether or not you want it to be then they are you know, a text to alert, to and then you know, you were going, uh, this is just a couple of slides telling you yeah. how that would look, but of course, it's much more involved because there's a whole and so my problem statement is that each of you have to be snatched. Actually, getting set up takes group. a little bit of time. So, it's when I right uh, design how it to fit all the leading causes of death among the training models. So this is this is the experience of how this works and treatment. Okay, okay. so it's it broken down into several phases. The first phase yeah. would involve developing the best that's true. Yeah. Body yeah. Body yeah. Body yeah. Body and even again, this is that anecdotal thing. We would go to and then. We would move on residential to the agent agent to do the phase. education. After we the have the work we saw the disparity first hand. There was agent. someone who was white and you who was recently diagnosed in the last two years. Would be good, they would um, be able to explain to everything they already knew. Like with African American people, that's not twenty twenty five. 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 Twenty twenty they were silent. And so then we would go through a training process and we would train so both the case all the and the app data. users on how to program it, yeah. how it's supposed to function. There's a tool to entry coming here. Um, Women are less likely to like the thing about the case workers themselves won't have as a result of having low viral They need to explain this to the three at a time. They need to understand how we're speaking. So then they would get assigned their phones with the app preloaded. And the importance of monitoring the process of the program, the tools that we have, the process evaluation, the career, um, the evaluation the phase of the project, none of us can make three evaluations. The whole thing is an evaluation. So we can come up with a process to evaluate. But um, one thing I want to um, check in is we will uh, halfway through a three and see how things are going for the women. Functioning to see whether people find it um, um, useful, um, how the alert system is functioning, just to get a sense of how things are going. And then, like for this type of check in, so when you something yeah. probably like you know, you know, and they would have a survey, so they would have to come back in for that. You know, help us to evaluate that program. And so I'm blessed to have her. So we provide both the caseworkers and the app users 
interviews after they finish the whole process because I would like to have the time to be discussing how it works. Be tan and not the good. These are parts of the agency. So we can get to the top of the board and whether or not we need to go back to that or we have to set the relationship to it. And some that have already um, And so the final they thing they want to do is they want to be okay? So if it's a positive outcome, people found it useful, they thought it helped them to track their meds better, and they were charging better. Um, then the I think we can Dallas move into a kind of final production really, and see if we can get really sure like they want to do something. Um, if the outcomes are negative, then I think we need to. And I'm proud of the fact that we even have support from non traditional partners. So that's kind of how it is. So, I didn't know this. Some of the B10 activities and partners are talking about some of this stuff. B10 works in collaboration. We've already developed on the topic, and so that would be involved. We talked about H. In terms of the worship advisory board, this is a certain back of the I worked on the first page when I did the National Women in Health HIV Awareness State. And so, a good relationship. These are just some people that we have connected with now, and we're still building this. I mean, so it's, there are a lot of people that I'm kind of meeting for that one thing that I do make a note of that. And this is my AHU. did. Presentation and it really uh, let me show that even outside of this, we have our friends. I need to make this is something to challenge. It is different. Different. I, I think I mirror the thoughts of a lot of my colleagues in that. The best part of the experience is making sure that everyone's at the table. Such a diverse group of people, and each and every member of that class impacted my life in some way. I learned something from everybody. Um, uh, it's 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 but even you know, and I got so much from each person, and I did, you know, I found something beautiful about each person. You know, uh, and it just really touched me. So I, that, that was the part. But the challenge for me was also being in a small space in October um, to a small group of you know, students in the health studies department. Secondly, doing the two programs where I targeted. Um, um, intelligent, young black women and beautiful women college women who are maybe at risk so, for HIV um, because of experience and intimate partner violence. Well, on the flip side of that, thank you, folks. Um, thanks to BAI staff, women already living with HIV who may um, experience my, violence because of fear exposure. And so, we already know that women, the young women who are in a relationship, you know, are. I'm not going to do a lot of time. More apt to acquire HIV than someone who has not been in an abusive relationship. And then we know that women living with HIV experience violence at least double the just so on both hands. They're vulnerable. I think some other successes would be building. You know, and reigniting, reestablishing, and reinvigorating relationships um, with the previous office fellows in the areas have, you know, I think that's the women in the, 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 the Dallas area who have made an indelible mark is trying to pick your brain as to interview. And we're like, whether they're not in the work now or they don't need them or they are doing the work. Um, they have a legacy that these women know, you know, the conditions and are respected. And so, we and need to be looking at that always. The issue for the people that the fellows should be working together. We're in the same city, so we will allow us to do that. Okay? And I think that if we can, then, you know, with the establish posture that we are of color um, to kind of come out into the community and do more outreach and Speaking and programs and education and through my yeah, again, the study, also I, you know, finding my parents have a hundred women. Do they know me and they know them? So when I'm ready to minister service at that point, then I can just talk them. If you already have a relationship, a great relationship whereby they trust me and they know me and they would be willing to trust that the information is going to be used because what we heard in the focus group was that they're tired of being used. There's no stories being yeah. told. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Out of several hundred doctors, there's one. The others who are of color, not that many of them. Did you get what I'm saying? So the African American representation is Regina Williams. But also, for us, in my organization, we did do these. Some of you may know her because she has her several research because we did have a couple more. So they were part of her now. They're no longer part of our community. Here's our Gilead rep giving a presentation. Um, first, thank you for your presentation. It was really, really good. Um, and these slides are beautiful. And Deborah Hall. Um, I wanted to say, no, know if the state health okay. department and she's over the exactly. state of black women's initiative. Um, all of these are creating apps every day. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if you had been in contact with folks from the Some of you, um, particularly folks at George Washington, um, because I know like a lot of researchers are like putting in uh, proposals like the government to get money to do just what you're asking to do. I, I, the last time I attended one of the DCC farm meetings, they were having a, uh, underserved populations working group meeting or something. And so there, were, the, the room was full of, full of people. And so when they went around the room, they asked what people were doing, and I explained like, why they're there. And of course, I went to the Institute. Um, and um, I talked to them about, I mentioned the app to that group. And so afterwards, you know, someone came up to me and said, oh, well, you know, I know someone else who's going to do you know, trying to do some research in the HIV. And so that was all that I got, you know, I, I didn't get, this, oh, this is such a great idea. I've talked to doctors in my network, um, the AIDS clinical trials group, and they're excited about it, but no one is excited. Right, in terms of providing the funding to get it done. From the standpoint, I personally don't want to have to start a nonprofit to go out and get funding to do this app. So if I could partner with a, a nonprofit or what have you, help to get this proposal written so we can get it, get it funded. Because I think, again, I think if we tailor it right, it could really work. I and mean, I think it could be something that can help a certain segment of the population. Maybe not everybody, but it could be a few people. That will help them kind of manage better and stay in care. That can make a big difference. Thank you all for your time. So that concludes this room. Um, thank you all for sticking it out for the whole day. Congratulations to you all. You are officially. Yeah. 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 Yeah.